do I fit in? I may not win, but I can't be thrown out here on my own. Out here on my own. Welcome back. That's to beautiful. That's that's, beautiful. that's really beautiful. That's, I love that. That's really beautiful. I love that. That's beautiful. <laughs> that's just so beautiful. Welcome back to another episode of Showgaze Movie Musical Podcast, where we are talking this episode about fame, the 1980 cinema verite classic, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and 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 a movie that I thought was different from what it was. I'll just I'm yeah. just gonna start we, we right off the bat, a little bit, guys. We messed up a little bit on this one. I think. <laughs> there, listen, there are four songs in this film. I still I would still say it, it is a movie musical. Okay. But what? I would, but I would say that I had a different understanding of what this was based on an experience that I had in my high school. Okay, okay. this is this is a movie with music. Obviously, this is a movie it's music, not yeah. a musical. Well, come see, comes up. <laughs> well, come. It, we said we have <laughs> come we have pretty clear definitions of these things, and we know that it's a bit in that. I don't think we've really ever um, taxonomied these things actually on this podcast. <laughs> I feel that we have. I feel that we have, and we know that the music is diegetic. So, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, listen, we watch Sister Act, so we can watch this. It's fine. Sure. Speaking of Sister Act, R.I.P. Maggie Smith, obviously. Oh, yeah. Go with God, Crispin. Go with God, Crispy. Um. How is everybody doing today, Molly? You well? Yeah, Molly. I'm well. Um, I just like wrapped a big project today at work, so I'm feeling very good. <gasps> the new but swing set has stuff. been built. <laughs> yes, yeah. I was personally building a swing set, and it's now complete. <laughs> we actually are doing a, a reno on our playground at the preschool, and um, that's getting close. That's to short for that's short for renovation, RJ. Thank mm-hmm. you for those yeah. of you not in the business. Oh, okay, so the <laughs> is the playground currently down for refurbishment, or is um, it still operating? It is not operating, but they it's okay. the new one is built and they're just like setting the spongy ground stuff. Oh yes. Mm. yes. Um is the heat bad there right now? I know parts of California is hitting record heat. Oh really? No. Not no, at it's all. always nice in San Diego. That's it's the regular, thing about San Diego. Really. It's always perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's not I mean, it's yeah, well it's pretty nice here most of the time. It's it's uh <laughs> the thing that we get in the like fall and spring is that it's very misty and overcast in the morning. So you have to wear a lot of layers because it start the day oh, starts chilly and then it gets hot. Yeah. Is that just from like the sea breeze? Yeah, just it's like the marine layer or whatever. It's called June Gloom in the spring. Um oh, cute. That's what yeah. There's no local San Diego queen named June Gloom. I think that's just there's gotta be. There's, There's gotta be. There needs There's to be multiple. Molly. Yeah. Bio Queen Molly, ready to go. Here we Bio go. Queen Molly. Um, how are your allergies? We've been worried sick. Uh, they're bad. I, I have an app where I'm tracking it, but tomorrow I'm going to a primary care appointment <gasps> to get a referral to an allergist. So we're working uh, on it. Happening. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. Are we gonna do the the shots and then they're gonna say, Oh, you're actually allergic to half of the world's living organisms? <laughs> probably, so like, probably cool. that's what's gonna happen. Yeah. That's what Great. I'm predicting. <laughs> yeah, I had a coworker that did that. Once yeah, and she all showed all of all of the things. Oh man, it's crazy. RJ, I'm doing okay. Um, great. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I made I made a delicious matzo ball soup today, Adam. You did. You made a very. It was. I. I think the only time I like chicken noodle soup is well, there's no, there was no noodles in this, but yes. the only time I like chicken soup is when it's like homemade. Yeah, I feel insulted that you would make a matzo ball soup before Rosh Hashanah. That's you're entirely off of the Jewish calendar. Well, here. Molly, I was fully about to make chicken noodle soup, and then Adam was like, "Well, you know, you well, know, what's better said, than noodles." I said you could do dumplings. And then quickly was like, "Like matzo balls," or also you could do matzo ball soup. So I was like, well, you should eat some apples and honey for a sweet new year. (gasps) Ooh, Mm -hmm. yes. Are you a, what's your apple of choice? I'm a gala apple girl. Mm. Mm -hmm. Not a honey crisp, the Minnesota state apple. I know. Yes. From the university of Minnesota. Too sweet for me though. Too Mm. sweet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. RJ, your apple. (laughs) Uh, I like a, I I think I like a gala as well. Mm. Um, I don't like one that's too like when the skin's too tough. Mm. Uh, like a red delicious. Yeah. Ugh. Um I used to love red delicious when I was a kid and liked the sweeter apples, but yeah, I'm off mm. of them now. Sorry. But I, I I do love an occasional green apple. I do love a little oh. like 
tart. Tart. sour. Yeah, a little ta- yeah. tart. What about a what about a golden delicious? That's a good. Oh, I love oh. That's a great oh. apple. Well, yeah, it's been yeah. a while since I've had a golden delicious. You know, it's a delicious if it has the five points at the bottom. Oh, really? Yep, both gold mm. and red delicious have the five with wow. the star. Welcome bottom. back to our apple pod. Welcome back to our apple pod. My that favorite apple is the Macintosh apple, if anybody's oh. curious. Oh, that's the a, actual that's one. I'm not making a joke oh, about the real. computer. Okay. I, I mean the actual Is apple. Macintosh Michigan? That's where I've always had them. Mm. They're like, they they ripen very quickly. Uh, they only are available in like apple picking season. Like they're not, mm. it's not a year round situation. But <laughs> Next so weekend good. is apple. This weekend. this weekend, it's the apple festival here in, in Chicago. Wow. In Wicked Square. In Square. And I told Adam I mean, someday I would yeah. love to go to an apple picking, like a, a apple, proper apple orchard. orchard. The last few years I've gone to like some sort of a fall festival thing here. Mm-hmm. And I just, it just makes me sad. It just makes me feel like, <laughs> Hey, remember when you lived in a place that actually had fall? Yeah. It's, yeah. Like, it's like my culture isn't your costume. Exactly. Southern California. Exactly. Thank you so much. <laughs> Everybody's got like a wide, a big hat on and like a scarf yeah, and like a t-shirt. Yeah, you from know. my basic white girl life. Yeah, yeah. how dare. Um, Molly, do we have anything in the mailbox? We sure do. Guess who wrote us <gasps> two emails. Two? Yeah. Who it better be think? your mother and my mother. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's obviously Lucas. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lucas says that he loves Oliver. He said, um, this film and the original Annie are to me what the sound of music and uh, Mary Poppins are to Adam. For Adam. Mm. Wow. So you like um, being depressed. I guess Annie's not depressing, but it's not depressing. Oliver is also the setting is it's 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 optimistic characters in a difficult setting. Yeah. yeah. Um he says I so he wrote this before we released the episode and then the second email is his reaction to the episode. He said, oh, I hope you put some respect on Oliver's name. Um, <laughs> it's a great adaptation of a so-so stage show uh, with some of the best movie musical performances and choreo- choreographed sequences I've ever seen. The entire aesthetic is what Les Mis by Tom Hooper sh- should have been. Yeah. 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 Well, that's T. Uh, I can't believe Oliver was the last of the 1960s best picture winners and that musical wouldn't win again. A musical wouldn't win again until Chicago in 2002. I think... Like I said in the episode, I think it's like it was so good, but like you can't have too much of that. I think the problem yeah. is that people got sick of it, really. It's like a specific genre, too. Yeah. Like a movie musical is like a, spe- yeah. And mm-hmm. like if horror was to win like t- five of like a decade's best pictures at yeah, some point, they'd be like, we're done. It. We're done honoring horror as a genre. I was actually, I was about to say this, which is maybe commentary for our own podcast that I find that shows that don't have like seasons I will get burnt out of sometimes like things that like like our podcast that that releases mean? every like something that releases just every su- two weeks or whatever oh, like, like every day yeah every instead day. of being oh. like we have an on season and an off season sometimes oh, I need an off season is that what you're arguing something. for because I'm happy to oblige Molly, I'm happy. if you want to go Molly, to six months a year if, let's or if we want to take a couple off. years off yeah maybe, <laughs> maybe we should maybe we should have a team meeting about this but we'll I will meeting. say <laughs> there are podcasts that I've had to like it like institute a season break for myself because yeah. I'm like, I've just, I love this. I just, I hear it too consistently and I need a little, a little right. breather from it. Yeah. Well, I do yeah. like binging podcasts. So sometimes when I'm like caught up with a podcast, it feels really weird that I'm like, Oh, I don't like being appointment. Like I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Ew. You like have the back catalog. Yeah. Um, Lucas points out that Showgate's Cinemusical podcast, thank you, Lucas, for um, yes, ending that the rebrand, yes. um, has covered seven of the 10 Best Picture winners. And so he requests a ranking of those. Whoa. Um, you did haven't he, did covered. He what they are for? Yeah, I know. He, yeah, she's he listed saying. the three that we haven't done. So we're going to have to go do perfect. research to figure out which ones we have. <laughs> I feel like we, I'm sure we said in each episode that they were Best Picture winners, but I don't remember them. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the ones that we haven't covered are The Broadway Melody, The Great mm-hmm. Ziegfeld. Mm-hmm. Gotta have a Follies number, obviously. Hopefully it's all Follies numbers. And then Going My Way. Oh, uh, I don't know that one. I don't know no. any of those. Um, mm-hmm. Those are probably only available in the internet archive as well. <laughs> um, oh, wait, no, he did list them after. Sorry. In order of release, oh, nice. the ones that we did. Thank you, Lucas, for doing our groundwork for us. Thank uh, you. An American in Paris, Gigi, mm-hmm. West Side Story, My Fair Lady, Sound of Music, Oliver, and Chicago. Molly was um, on the podcast for some of those episodes, but she can also share her rankings. Yeah, She listened. Sure. I listened yes. to the episodes when they came out and I obviously have seen Because all of Molly them. was first before she was our friend, she was a fan. <laughs> and let's That's really let's really <laughs> canonize that. That's not true at all. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> 
So oh my God. we just wanted to reach out to the little people who support I knew, us. I knew <laughs> both of you Jamokes before you were ever on the internet. <laughs> Uh, okay. Okay, and then finally, as a golden age recommendation, I would love to get your opinion on Rajan Hammerstein's flower drum song from 1960. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. I've just seen um, I Enjoy Being a Girl. That's it. Okay. Lucas says it's one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen. It's a hidden gem in the RNH catalog. It has an almost all Asian cast, the same in the same year that West Side Story won that Oscar. Um, cool. And it, it features a Shogay's alum or two. Ooh. <gasps> Um, in my opinion, the story doesn't suffer from the same. Catherine Zeta Jones. <laughs> <laughs> She's racially ambiguous. So. <laughs> Uh, doesn't fall, suffer from the same pitfalls as other RNH works featuring Asian characters like The King and I and South Pacific. It's still some white men writing an Asian focused story, but it's not all about colonialism, slavery, slavery, or racism. It's a love story about a young immigrant in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Also, I feel you need to cover it because it's the only RNH adaptation that hasn't been covered on the pod. Fix that blind spot, y'all. It's really well. That's we not true all, because we you know, have not done State Fair. And did we do Oklahoma? Did you guys do Oklahoma? We did. We did. RJ, oh, RJ, okay. and I did Oklahoma. Gotcha. We have not done State Fair, which technically is it's just a movie musical. They, it it was not did. it was not a it was not a stage adaptation oh. first. Mm. So maybe gotcha. that's why he's not counting, but we've gotcha. not done State Fair either. Fairs. We love we love fairs and musicals. So we love fair, did. Minnesota. <laughs> yes. Um, Molly's cookies or whatever. Molly's like, what is it? Sweet Martha's. Martha's. Sweet Martha's. <laughs> yeah. Molly's cupcakes. <laughs> Uh, Lucas, as I said, wrote that email before our Oliver came out and had a request slash threat for us to enjoy Oliver and uh, followed up saying, just listen to your episode. I'm so happy you enjoy Oliver as much as I do. <laughs> That's the email. <laughs> what were the movies? Chicago? Were, are we ranking them or do we, wa- or do we want to save it for our show? I feel you know, like this showies. might be a, a showies request. Well, and I also wonder, the question is, should we watch those other three? And then definitively and then rank them. Do it f- definitively rank them. Sure. Yeah. We'll sure. we'll do our research and see if we can find them. Um, and if they're on the internet archives, make sure you donate because they, they need the support. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks anyway, for writing in, thank Lucas. you, Lucas, Lucas, for writing in. Everybody, write in and say whether we should do seasons. Yes. yes. Everyone, write in and tell us if we should at least get like holiday, winter holiday off, and then you know just start fresh in like Jan. Jan Feb. Mm. We I have our. Like, God. No, no, no. I was going to say it's hard because I feel our like movie, mu- new movie musicals come out. Yes, that's when they yeah. come yeah. out. It's Christmas. Yeah. I think also, like, I feel like the holidays is when I most need, like, podcasts and stuff. Like, I need, I'm traveling, yeah. I'm like hanging out with family, but I need some me time. Like, you know what I mean? Right. I don't want to yeah. deprive people around that time of year, but maybe we'll figure out an off season. And I do want to shout out to one of our listeners, John Zell, who just recently realized that I play the trailer for the <laughs> upcoming movie at the end of every episode. <laughs> because when we were in a live, RJ and I, he was like, would you ever think about like letting us know what the next movie is going to be on Showgaze? And I was like, we already do. You <laughs> just don't. The starling deer. <laughs> wait till the end. Did, so was he did not it, listening all the way to the end or did he not? No, yes. Did he as not realize the credits, that's what the, oh, okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. The credits play credits, and he right. was like, all right. Next. That, you got to sit. You got to stick. If, if the Marvel Cinematic Universe has taught us anything, you got to stick mm-hmm. all the way till after the credits. Yeah. The credits. Do you keep know what straight. I uh, keep forgetting to tell you guys? I deactivated my Instagram like four months ago and oh. we still promoted at the end of our oh, show. RJ's, oh, yes. RJ's my... handle's completely wrong. I think Great. I changed my Twitter name. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. I, I'm going to re... I'm, I'm, social media. Well, I'm going to re... You we'll, don't need to find we'll, social media. We'll send a rebrand, you know, when we do our cinema musical re-brand. rebrand. Yeah. At the rebrand. Yeah. It'll be all included. Great. Adam will prepare the pitch, you know, and... Would you call me? <laughs> <laughs> um, Great. Molly. Yeah. It's back to you again. Uh, you have the challenge this week to summarize the plot of 1980s fame in one minute or less. And your time starts now. The movie follows multiple teenagers from auditions to graduations at the public high school of the performing arts in New York. First, Doris, who rejects what she considers a boring Jewish identity and embraces becoming other people through acting. Ralph Garcia slash Raul Garcia, who learns to be authentic and honest about his background, but later struggles with alcoholism as he breaks into stand-up comedy. Montgomery, who just feels really bad about being gay. Bruno, who conflicts with his instructors about his electronic instruments. Coco, who exceeds as a triple threat, but is exploited and tricked into appearing in an adult film. Lisa, who gets kicked out of dance and becomes seemingly suicidal, but actually just transfers to drama. Hillary, who drops out of school to join the San Francisco Ballet after having an abortion. And Leroy, who almost fails out due to illiteracy. 
And that's well under a minute. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. I was worried with we all the bullet a, points. A bullet I mean, point it, approach. I mean, it makes sense because there's really no wrapping up of a plot. There's no plot. No, there's no there plot. There's no though. wrapping up. I have never, I have complained before about a lack of a finale. And there is a, there is a final musical there number that final. appears. So mm-hmm. it was sort of, it was sort of the opposite issue that I usually have where I was like, <laughs> I guess there's a finale, but is there a resolution to any <laughs> plot? <laughs> but was there a story <laughs> that I completed? Just looking for a denouement anywhere anybody <laughs> anybody see one um okay well i'm gonna start because i remember i was the one that suggested we watch fame yes. mm. because in high school my high school did fame the musical mm. our, my freshman year i was not in fame the musical because mom had found porn on the family computer so i was i was not allowed to audition you're grounded but then a I can't weeks, believe you like just put a, your business on the internet like that. Okay. Well, Continue. you know, it's, it's, everyone makes yeah. mistakes. <laughs> then uh, I was 14 or like a month later, I was 14. First of all, that was the explanation for why I was watching porn. Okay. Obviously. Then a month later, um, there was auditions for like the, the a summer show called Honk and I got mm. the lead. So really it all <laughs> worked so out. Was that, was that a Mother Goose musical? It is the story of the Ugly Duckling. Oh. It's a it's a TYA, but it's good. It's a British show. Anyway, um, so I was not in Fame, but I think I helped with like stage crew, I think, mm. or something. I did something for the show at the end because I didn't go. S- I saw it like in dress rehearsal, and then what? It doesn't matter. So I was familiar with the musical, and I know that our director in high school, she had them watch the movie on the first day of rehearsal, but I was not in the rehearsal. So I was like, Oh, I've always wanted to see it, but I've never like really had the chance, like an excuse to sit down and watch fame. So this is not the movie that I expected it to be. Yeah. Um, it was not a musical. <laughs> it was, it was not a, we'll quibble about the musical, <laughs> but more importantly, the show on Broadway or it was never on Broadway technically, but the show version, um, cleans a lot of it up Mm. and makes it more like hopeful. Um, Mm. Not that I think this is like, it doesn't, it's it's kind of in the middle of the, yes, there's a ton of darkness in this film. Yeah. And they're going, I mean, like it's fully coming out of that seventies era where it's just like, we're going to show life as it really Mm -hmm. fucking is. And it's disgusting. It's really (laughs) New York. Looked disgusting yeah, and good, horrible. They were kissing. She was kissing the subway glass. And I <laughs> wanted to rinse her mouth out with soap. I was so grossed out. Um, yeah, so this is not the movie I thought it was. I have interesting thoughts about the film, I yeah. think. But um, very surprising when I was watching it. So that's my that's my history of fame. But the fame of the show is actually... Um, it's not great, but there are good parts of it there's like a teacher's argument where the english teacher and the dance teacher like argue over leroy whose name in the musical is tyrone yeah they change names too they change names none of the songs are the same it's different Mm -hmm. songs um and they have a song called teachers teachers argument and it's like the dance teacher's like it's about like learning how to be an artist and the english teacher's like it's about being a person community and society and uh, that's you know the classic argument but what's community and society the name of our learning community freshman year is that what arts and society arts and society Society, honey Mm -hmm. yeah um so that's it uh rj fame 1980 fame i'm gonna live forever um i this is my first time watching this movie I knew of like Debbie Allen and her, you know, like her impact as, as fame. (laughs) She is not fame, by the way. She's not fame. She's not the main girl. She's in she's, this movie. She is. She's, she's, she's in this movie. One of the dance teachers at the. She's the dancer teacher at the audition that's like ogling Leroy. She is not a teacher. Oh, she's what? one of the students. No. She's like Michael, like the senior who was like helping with auditions. Oh. She was like that. That's what the idea I thought was. That she. Oh, oh, you're saying it's the same person I'm imagining, but she wasn't a teacher. Correct. Yeah. Gotcha. But Debbie Allen, like, oh, I feel like her legacy is so synonymous to fame because, because fame was real. It no, was a real school. Was real? <laughs> well, it's based on a real school, but based on a real school, it's, it's okay. not real. Um, no, that's what I mean. Yeah, like there is a oh, real yeah. performing because school she, that she is the. She nope. She was there was a show. There was a TV show. Oh, and she was she was the same character in the TV show. Okay, 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 okay. Lydia. Because I knew Debbie Allen from... Well, didn't she direct one of the movies that we watched? Yes. Do you not remember which one? 
I don't. Dolly Parton, baby. Oh, Christmas, in the Christmas in the Square. Christmas in the Square. <laughs> Our People first everywhere. female director on Showgaze. We got to do another Christmas on the Square type of film. Man, yeah, that, was, that was a good time. Some trash. Yeah. Some <laughs> trash. Um, okay, so then, yes, it was that. It was that. I knew her from uh, being a judge on So You Think You Can Dance, which is the dance, mm. uh, dance version. Which of is American obviously Idol. where she got that girl that played the angel in <laughs> Christmas in the Square. Absolutely. Who was, in, who was in The Perfect Couple, which was recently released on Netflix. She oh, wow. Like, You're following the careers of everyone. <laughs> I know. Well, I noticed her, obviously. It's she's her, like one it's of her favorite film sheet we've ever watched yeah. on Showgate. <laughs> she's, she's one of the like PR people for Nicole Kidman's character. Oh, okay. oh yeah. with the wig. Nicole Kidman with the wig? Yeah, Nicole Kidman in the has a blonde wig in that movie, right? It's very I curly. Guess. It's like bouncy curls. Well, Pastor Christian, yes, yes. Josh Segar, Pastor Christian, Josh Segarra was in the new season of Abbott Elementary. Oh, was he? So, mm-hmm. Oh, he's like is the, he the district guy. Yeah, he's like the new guy oh, that, that she like wow, likes. Yeah, yeah. Pa- wow. Pastor Christian, Father Christian. Wow. Whatever his name oh, it's Pastor Christian. Pastor for Christian. Sure. Um. So I knew. So I and like Debbie Allen's like. She was like the Broadway like expert because they would bring like, you know, like uh, different subject matter fields mm, of whatever type mm-hmm. of dance. And she was like the Broadway one or like, yeah, that style. So I knew of her for that. And then I. And I, from being a legend. Yeah. Also just knowing Debbie Allen from being a legend. Yeah. 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 But I'm just saying that when I first yeah. watched was that show. That yeah. was where the first time I saw her. Um, and uh, American Idol season two. Uh 12th place, Vanessa Olivares is saying out here on my own on her semifinal performance. And so I knew that song heart to heart. I think they do it. I think they do that song again in the remake in 2009. I'm trying to remember. Mm. I watched mm. it in theaters. I shouldn't have. I keep bad. confusing. That is not the one with the Huff, Julianne Huff. Julianne Huff was Footloose, right? Or was Julianne Huff also in Fame, the remake? That's a great question. Um... <laughs> Uh, fame and fame. The remake was a movie. It was not Julianne Huff. She was that was. Oh, but it's Kay Panabaker from. Isn't she a Nick girl? She was a uh, Braided and Weep, Summerland. That was it. That was a Nick she, ABC mm. Family show. I think she was ABC Family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, was, it wasn't good. Maybe she was. Is that her? Is that Julianne? Yeah, that kind of looks like her. <laughs> Um, and then uh, because Irene Cara, who is Coco, she was kind of like a 70s songstress. Mm. Uh, she sings Flashdance, What a Feeling. That was her other big hit, like huge billboard hit. Flash three, Dance, well, actually, feeling. that's three years after this. But yeah. Oh, really? Mm-hmm, 83. Um, that was a huge billboard hit. So like growing up, obviously, in my family's disco discography, Irene Cara was, uh, was a staple. Heavy in, rotation. In heavy rotation, yes. Mm. Molly Fame. Molly Fame. Thoughts Hop on, on fame. Thoughts relationship on fame, with fame. The general concept of. <laughs> I'm not interested in the general concept of. I <laughs> thought that I had watched this movie. Mm. And then I watched this and I don't think I watched this movie. Mm. And then I was like, maybe I watched the 2009 and then I watched the trailer of that. And I was like, I also don't think I watched that movie. So I don't know what movie is in my head, but I have some recollection of watching a movie about a performing arts high school like when I was in middle school and being like, that's not what I thought performing arts high school would be like slash what I thought this movie was going mm-hmm. to be. But again, I don't think it was that I'm so confused. I've never, I've never been quite so confused about what exactly happened in my past as I am watching this film, but I feel like mm. I would remember some of this stuff. Now, maybe I think I was like watching it on TV and maybe some of this stuff got cut from some fame, it, but yeah. mm. I have some recollection. I feel like half of this movie would have you to would not be able to. Yeah. TV. Yeah. I thought I remembered the scene. I remembered there being a scene of like it's overwhelming in the cafeteria and they're singing a song. Well, that they've done that at Sidetrack. They'll do that song in Sidetrack. But I'm saying like my too. memory of this movie that I watched as a child no, okay, includes okay. that. And then I yeah, remember a scene where yeah. somebody is like walking by the park and is saying that she's going to like leave to go dance with some other dance company or to pursue some other opportunity or something. And I don't think that happened. But in that this didn't movie. happen in this. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe I just watched the Cheetah Girls and I confused it with that or I don't know. Well, I, there don't is know a vi- I mean, there is a like for like Cheetah Girls uh, reference from Fame and 
Oh, the scene where Coco where she gets out of the taxi off. and she, she walks up to the door and then she mm-hmm. sees that the yes. car pulled away, so she yes. walks down. walks away. I did. She, I did yeah. put the connection together with Cheetah Girls in that one. So, you know, I watched something as a child, and I don't think it was this. And uh, like Adam, it you know wasn't what I expected, but here we are. It does feel here like we are. it does feel like. Because I had also never seen it before, but it does feel like I feel like I've picked up enough of fame. I know it's a performing <laughs> arts high school. Mm-hmm. I know the song Fame. Like I've, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna live, live forever. forever. Yeah, I'm gonna learn how to fly. And fly. I, I, I wonder if that's like as theater people, we just like have like, th- like we. Well, just first know of all, fame yeah. the song is so good. It's like well, anthem. It's like it's, it's like a TV anthem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels like it feels like this is the. Theme I mean, song it's disco, and we all know how I feel about that. But like, it right. is it is memorable. I'll give you that. <laughs> high praise from Molly. from Molly I do have to say <laughs> I went to a I went to a magnet high school oh, for so the you were arts. Oh, so it's kind of giving that I went to fame <laughs> okay but if you went to fame we did, I did not to be very clear we did not audition you could just go ah uh, okay so I was a, a little confused with the like syllabus and logistics they kept saying like you had to it wouldn't hurt if you were good at everything but it seemed like people were specializing people were in departments I think I don't think mm-hmm. that you yeah I was not clear about that either so like Coco is in the dance department it seems we see her in the dance classes mm-hmm. but yes. then she's like a singer and I wasn't clear like does she not get to do, do they not teach piano. her to sing here yeah. she just has to like know that out outside of her specialty like what's the deal although we don't really see anybody who sings as like their like the I music mean, department seems to be instruments only and nobody seems to be getting yes. voice lessons so maybe they just don't offer that I don't know she's like the only one that's like a singer singer because even when they do their graduation song she's kind of like the only one that's like <laughs> yeah out of all the main characters right. she's right. the one that can sing yeah yeah um but would you what department would you have well in f- in, oh, obviously drama. It's yeah. all of us are drama. Yeah. We would be the ones be breathing serious. in a circle. Yep. We would be stretching. This, this yeah. I have to tell you all, if you didn't go to theater school, this is extremely this accurate. Is very <laughs> accurate. The drama very department classes. Stuff you do and theater yes. school. Yes. yes. Breathing together, making when people he, when like he was just like tell when you were secrets. laying down on the floor and he was like, feel the the floor against every muscle. Absolutely. Like feel it against your the back of Literally your legs. Literally moving. And I was class. like, oh my God. Four, yeah. Classroom 409. Mm-hmm. Laying on that resin Think floor. Think about the way you do everything. <laughs> your body is a machine. Yeah. I was like, oh, uh, oh yeah. God. Um, there's a song in, there's a line of the, in this movie where all three teachers of the three departments are like, music is the hardest profession. Mm-hmm. The, the hardest mm-hmm. is dance, like blah, blah, blah. So in the show, they have a song. It's just like the opening song. I don't remember what it's called, but all three departments all sing about how their like discipline is the hardest and then they do it like yeah. a, a, in rotation. That's really Although cool. to be fair, the acting instructor is not saying that acting is the hardest one to do. He's just saying it's the hardest thing to be in because you get yes. so much. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. True. I actually almost went to a performing arts high school. I looked into it, but it was a new charter or new magnet or something mm. like that. And my parents did not want me to go there because they weren't sure if the academic stuff was going to be kind of up to snuff. And since it was only like the second year of operating, they didn't have any like info to back up like oh no our no graduates data. do yeah, go no to data. high school or do go to college or like you know that yeah. kind of thing so no famous fair. alums yet you know no famous <laughs> alums yet yes i think <laughs> probably that was the right decision but I, it is one of those things that every once in a while i think about like oh, i wonder if my life would have been different if i had gone to that high school instead you know yeah. well sometimes i'll think about that just like in college like what if i went to like a more like an i got a bfa and like really just focused on mm. theater is this episode just gonna be us trauma dumping Let's let's I do it. I wasn't expressing trauma, but like uh, we can. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, this is the movie to talk about trauma, honey, because the characters all <laughs> the characters were doing it, it. In, it yeah. in the middle of class, girl. <laughs> that also felt very theater to be like, uh, yeah. Mm, yeah, we should stop doing that. What's really blocking your access to yeah. this character? Tell us your intimate secrets. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is Fame. It's directed by Alan Parker, who we have watched another film of his, Evita, from 1996. Oh, okay. Uh, it is credited as written by Christopher Gore. I'll talk about that in a second. It is produced by David De Silva and Alan Marshall. Okay, they just list on Wikipedia basically the entire cast <laughs> as starring in alphabetical order. So here we go. Eddie Barth, starring Eddie Barth as Angelo Martelli. His dad. The kid's dad. <laughs> Irene Cara plays Coco Hernandez. Uh, Lee Carreri plays Bruno Martelli, uh, the music student. 
Uh, Laura Dean plays Lisa Monroe, who gets kicked out of the dance program. Antonia Franceschi plays Hilary Van Doren, who's a haughty ballet girly who has an abortion. Uh, Boyd Gaines plays Michael, our favorite character, Michael. Do we all remember Michael? <laughs> Was that the like senior? Guy? That was the senior. Oh, the senior. <laughs> the senior, yep. Uh, Albert Haig plays Mr. Sharofsky, who is the head of the music department. Uh, Tressa Hughes plays Naomi Finsecker, who is um, an overbearing Jewish mother. Um, uh, who was that? That was Tressa. Steve Inwood plays Francois Lafitte. We all remember him. Uh, um, Paul McCrane plays Montgomery McNeil, the gay kid. Uh, and who also, he was in ER. He's the bald doctor in ER. Oh! I've never anyway. watched ER, but good for him. And Mira plays Mrs. Sherwood, who is um, A, um, the English teacher, and B, she is Jerry Stiller's wife and Ben Stiller's mother. Yes, she also plays Mary Brady in Sex in the City. As I was watching it, I was like, why do I know this face from I a recent know. thing? And it's because I was just rewatching Sex in the City. Mm. Joanna Merlin plays Miss Berg, the head of the dance department. Mm. Uh, Barry Miller plays Ralph Garcy, who is the a, a term I learned today, and I've already forgotten it, but it's basically like they basically wrote Freddie Prince into this movie and then they just changed the name but it's basically the exact same story wow um like there's that, a like, word for writing like in a term, almost like nom de plume it's like a french term but it's, Ooh, it's i don't know if i know I can, he's an analog it would be the, the thing i would know but i don't i'm sure that there's some more fancy word um who is that that was barry miller jim moody is mr farrell who is the drama teacher Gene Anthony Ray plays Leroy Johnson, who ends up playing the same role later on in the television, the television show. Oh, okay. And Maureen Teefy plays Doris Finsecker, who changes her name halfway through the film to uh, Dominique. 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 Something. Dominique D- Dupont. Dominique Dupont. Yeah. I don't hate Dominique. As a, as a I think she. I think she could have kept Doris. Honestly, I think she would have been cute as Doris Dominique. I, you. Absolutely not. In nineteen eighty, you could not. You could not. No, that's why you can't keep it. Mm-hmm. In nineteen eighty, now you could keep it and be like, "I'm doing a retro thing," but yeah. like, it's too close. It's too. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and also like all these characters, like Ralph trying to like hide the fact that he's Hispanic, like that wouldn't happen now. Right. Right. Yeah. It would be like it would be right. like your like seventeen year old niece would be named like Karen. And she's like, I cannot be named Karen. This yeah. can't be happening in my life. Um, the cinematography is by Michael Saracen. It is edited by Jerry Hambling. Music is by Michael Gore. Production company is MGM. and was distributed by United Artists. It was released. Uh, it was, had its premiere on May 12th, 1980, and then went wide June 20th, 1980. On the Wikipedia, by the way, the cast is, they have their department. And Coco has all three. Oh, she's a triple oh, okay. So sh- there you go. Running time is 133 minutes. Um, it's a long, it's long a long room. film. It's a long uh, film. Its budget was 8.5 million, and it hit, it made 42 million dollars. Wow! At the box office. A hit. It's a hit. Um, okay, so this one, this film was initially inspired by the song "Nothing" from a chorus line. When mm-hmm. uh, is her name Diana? I think her name is Diana. She sings the line where she's like, I always wanted to go to the high school of the performing arts. And then she gets in. She has, that's what the whole song is about. Um, so that was where the idea started of like, what if we did a chorus line where you learn about the lives of like artists, but it's actually just set in the high school, yeah. of performing arts, which is a real high school in New York public school system. Mm. Uh, you do have to audition to get in. You do have to be a New York public school or you have to live in New York. Obviously yeah. you can't like try whatever. Um, so that's cool. Um, they did not allow them to shoot in the high school of performing arts because the New York board of education was like, this script is wild. Yeah. And we will not, we will not be tolerating any of this. Yeah. And so they were like, well, fuck you. And they were like, okay, well that doesn't change our opinion. So you will not be filming in our high school. So they'd like find different places to shoot. They found like an old abandoned school in oh, New York, crazy. which is crazy. Why are we abandoning schools in New York? Who knows? Yeah. Um, Writing, I mentioned writing. So 
uh, the initial David De Silva was the one who saw a chorus line and had the idea, and then he had a script written by Christopher Gore. Then they and it was like very optimistic and hopeful, mm. and then they took it to Alan Parker, who rewrote the entire script, but was like, "But I'm still going to give Christopher Gore story the the credit, the writing, the sole writing credit. I'm not even going to put my name because I'm directing it." And that's where the darker tone comes mm. in because he thought it was more interesting to be like, "It's about them all wanting to win, and yet they keep losing at every like chance, every opportunity." Um, which is really a bleak way to look at the world. I know. <laughs> um, so that's that. Um, but is we're still in the like seventies. Like we're yeah. we're we're showing the grittier side of life. The Hayes after. Code has yeah. died, so yeah. we can now show everything. Yeah. We can say yeah. anything. We can have bounce bouncy teenage breasts on on screen. Isn't that thrilling for everybody? Um, <laughs> she was the, not a teenager. Like the actual actress is not right. I don't think any of them. Yeah, none of them. Just to clarify. I yeah. think only the girl who plays Lee. So Lisa is the only one who actually was a current student at oh, oh, high okay. school performing arts. Um, Irene Cara had gone there as well as Jean Anthony Ray, who plays Leroy. He okay. had also gone to the high school performing arts, but he had been expelled for um, being like, illiterate. Be, no, no, <laughs> but he was expelled for like talking back or like he like, disciplinary oh, stuff. Interesting. Disciplinary. Okay. Um, so I thought that was interesting that they actually had people in the cast yeah. who, had gone to the school that's like based on or whatever. Um, the film was initially called Hot Lunch. Um, it's referenced in the in the line at the end when Montgomery like is trying to make uh, Ralph, Ralph feel better after his be- after his after his set bombed. Uh, for those of you in the industry who might know what that means, um, it just means his set was bad. Um, he's like. <laughs> He says, like, the only thing we're guaranteed is seven classes and a hot lunch. So the uh, film is going to be called Hot Lunch. Well, I can see that line really does slap. So you would definitely. Want to <laughs> and then that. and then the director, somebody was like walking down Times Square, you know, back when like there were uh, like porn shops on every corner. In time, sure. Like before Disney had cleaned it up in the 90s. And one of the like recent adult films that had come out was called Hot Lunch. And it uh, was a euphemism for oral sex. So they were like, well, we've got to change the name. That. Name is of the film. Mean? Oral sex name, hot lunch. You don't see it? Do you want me to explain why why what you would eat would be warm? I'm happy to do it. You know what? Yeah, go ahead. As explain someone who's I've I can t- I've already admitted that I've watched porn before. <laughs> <laughs> well you're the only one. You're the only one on this podcast who's ever watched porn. I'm so the only like, one in the world. You, yeah. Um so they changed the name to fame, which I guess was a David Bowie song from like five years ago. Oh. I don't know. Not five years ago. Currently five yeah. years before the film. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, so some fun things happened while they were making this film. There were labor union disputes because they used um, a, most of their crew was British. Um, oh. So they like just for forego. I don't know how that works now. I don't know if it's different now, but at the time unions were not thrilled. Um, there was another thing where the cinematographer and the camera director, the camera operator, they, they liked to use this thing, uh, of single source lighting for the scene. So they would like have this smoke diffuser to like mm. cast this like kind of glow in the, in the room or whatever. And then the, the SAG and like another union, like wrote a letter being like, you have to stop using smoke around all these actors. Like these are not children, but base they might yeah. as well be like, they're like yeah, they're 19 years old. Um, so that was another one. And then when they shot the song fame, it took three days to shoot. Okay. They are not dancing to the song fame because it was not written at the time of filming. Ah. Oh, they are dancing to hot stuff by Donna summer. I was waiting for RJ. Hot stuff, baby. This evening. I want some hot stuff, baby tonight. <laughs> um, because it was a similar BPM to what they assumed oh. was going to be the song. Yeah, and then there were more union disputes because the camera operator had like left for personal reasons, and so the cinematography was doing all the shooting. But you're not there are things you're not supposed to like union rules. Blah blah. blah you're not supposed to if yeah. you're not the camera operator. So they like shut shut down day one, being like you have to hire actually camera people. 
Then day two, the New York police department ended the shoot early and enforced curfew at 4 p.m. because they had blocked traffic for so long. And then day three, the dancers ended up demanding extra pay for stunts they had to do on the taxis. They, and they were, girl, they were flopping around on those taxis. They, they were, were flopping they around were. on the taxis. <laughs> they, they were all over, all over and that And who was there visiting the set but one one own Bob Fosse visiting his friend Alan Parker as they filmed the sequence. Oh. Wow. And he they went out to dinner, I guess. I, I think it was like the first day he, they went out to dinner afterward and yeah. they both like were like, oh God, this sucks to shoot. <laughs> yeah. Because it's just like, like it. a long, arduous process. Yeah. Um, Academy Awards. Mm. Academy Awards. Uh, nominated for Best Screenplay, Best mm-hmm. Film Editing, Best Original Song for Out Here on My Own. And it ended up winning Best Original Song for Fame and Best Original Score. This is the first film in Oscar history to be nominated for two Best Original Songs at, wow. the, same, at the same award. Really laying the foundation for Frozen. Yes. <laughs> Of course. And Dream Girls. And Dream Girls. Um, that's it. That's all I have. There's a ton on trivia that none of them were interesting. Great. So I didn't feel like reading the biography of Freddie Prince, which would tell you that he did end up um, taking his own life. At like yeah. 22? At 22 years old. Oof. He's 20. Oh. Mm-hmm. Freddie Prince Jr.'s father, which I, I didn't know. Did it, yeah. I, mean, I figured I didn't it really out. I feel they said Freddie Prince in this, in this movie. Uh, was the first time that I thought, oh, was his dad also famous? Like I assumed that he was named right, after right. Freddie Prince, but I didn't know that that was he was a known person. Yeah. He was the yeah yeah. So that's it. That's all I got. You want to talk about the movie? Let's. Yeah, great. Let's discuss the movie Let's with music. Let's talk about theme. theme. Initial thoughts, Molly. Um, I mean, I liked it and that it was, I thought the characters were like generally compelling. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like Doris especially was very like, that's a real type in theater school of like, mm-hmm. yeah, feeling like the boring I, one. Um, yeah. I thought I was going to get tired of Bo- of Doris real quick. Yeah. And he ended up being really compelling as the yeah, movie went on. Definitely. Um, I kind of feel that way about multiple characters. I also yeah. like Ralph is like, he's intentionally great. Like they write him to be right. annoying to people mm-hmm. until he kind of, you know, learns to be a little bit more authentic. Um, you know, Montgomery was um, in the movie and <laughs> <laughs> look, I mean, he's so, I, I'm sorry to jump right into like the meat of things in some ways in a sh- yeah. show called Showgaze, but like his whole deal is just like, I I have all these problems and I've got this really deep, dark secret. And then it's just like that he's gay. And, and I, I know that times were different, right. but I just can't imagine at theater school he was the only a theater gay kid. school. I'm sorry, like it just there's no way, there's no way that he's like the one gay kid there, and that that's his whole, you know, plot line. His whole plot line is I'm gay and I go to an analyst. Yeah. Which is old fashioned term for those of you young chickens who listen to the pod for therapist. Yeah. Back in the day. And like, you know, kids didn't go to therapists back in the day. So when he tells Doris that, she's just like, what's wrong with you? Which is crazy. Right. Um, there are so many lines of this movie. I was like, whoa, it's yeah. 1980. Yeah. Holy hell. There are so many, sorry, rape jokes in this movie yeah. that oh, I was yeah. like, we got to stop, guys. It's really not funny. Or like the the whole like ongoing plot about the, the hole between the bathrooms and the boys just like, oh you know, God. standing oh and watching yeah. the girls change and stuff. Um, yeah. So definitely some stuff that's not great it is a project it is a product of its time it's a product of its time um but it was interesting to watch and i don't know like we were saying with the like optimism pessimism thing i'm not totally sure what the movie wants me to feel at the end of it yeah it wasn't like saying that uh, 
it wasn't like defending the school. It was kind of just like showing that like this was all hard for everyone involved. <laughs> yeah. And that like if you really love this, you are gonna go through this. But like I wish there was one at least example of like an optimist like they're uh, like they could have made it like out of all of these like really hard stories w- there would be there could be one that could like get get it, i you do know? feel like i feel like the movie still thinks maybe coco is gonna be successful like like she yeah, had this yeah. horrible exploitative thing happen to her but that doesn't mean it's the end of her career right right um her character dies in the musical oh the, the, it's not the same exact character because the story is a little different, but she she moves to L.A. because she's like, I'm going to make it big. And then she ODs on drugs. So. Okay. <laughs> well, that didn't happen here, so we're happy. For uh, no, I just think it's very interesting, like, because she's supposed to be that, like... What's his name? De Palma? David De Silva, who is the producer who had the initial idea for this. Yeah. He ended up, like, being heading the, like, musical version. And so that's why there is some like it is more hopeful and optimistic, but there is still that like really dark. dark. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, look, it would be silly to make it and be like, and then they were all successful and they all had a great time. Right. right? Like, obviously, that's not realistic. Um, Some people. But is it realistic for everyone to have like the worst time of their like the worst horrifying things? Doris had like a horrifying. I mean, Doris is like pretty happy at the end of it. I don't know if she's going to be successful or not, but like, I think she is grateful for the stuff that she learned um mm-hmm. i think that we we think that um well what's that guy's name leroy uh oh leroy will probably i mean yeah leroy and hillary both get into dance companies um bruno it seems like might have oh, well we don't know if leroy gets in the dance company yeah he might have because the last scene we see with him is him yelling at <laughs> but he's we, at oh, graduation uh, he did yeah, we see him in the dance sequence mm, at graduation. So I think that means that he made it to graduation. Um, so like I think that definitely it's not like they're all gonna f- completely fail. Um right. but I like I don't know, like are they gonna have great lives? But then like you, everybody's most people are gonna have like extraordinarily good lives, and that's fine. That's right. reality. Right. So fine i don't know i guess i guess i appreciate that it does feel in some ways realistic but i'm also not sure exactly what it's saying because we end it's just dance sequence of graduation end of movie there's no follow-up we have no so it's like entirely up to our imaginations what is gonna happen to the characters right the high school is the is the fifth um girlfriend in sex in the city the main character new york yeah new york is RJ, what did you think of the movie? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I ended up really liking the movie as well. Um, I think like the form of the movie was really, I was like compelled by it. I didn't think I would, but I liked that all of these moments were just so short with each of them, and we, I wasn't bothered by how much we kept moving from one person to the other. Mm-hmm. It wasn't as frantic. Like, there's enough time in these moments that you get, like, a good understanding of what they're going through i like that it goes from freshman year to obviously to the graduation like from the audition to the to the very end um even though we didn't get like completely like we weren't following like one hero like one protagonist or anything like that it was like still really interesting it kind of reminded me of like how when we watched all that jazz like there's something there was something compelling about like the the composition of the movie, like the film of the movie, like the filmmaking of it. Um, we like seventies movie musicals, obviously. I know this is technically yeah. like eighty, but like I think we're just all fans of the cinematic the style component of the seventies yeah. movie musicals. Yeah, mm-hmm. yes, because it does a good job of showing the gritty. I mean, yes, it's a, it's very much like on the uh, like all the way at the end of the spectrum. I think, but like. They're still able we're to shif- like, yeah, we're shifting the Overton window. Yes, <laughs> but we're st- they're still able to make it really like cinematic and compelling. That isn't just like dreary all the time. It's like dreary, but like showing up with, with a point, right? It's it's like yeah. it was showing like the the reasons behind it and stuff. And yeah. I found myself rooting for a lot of the characters. Like you really mm. do feel for them because you see them you know, very like doe eyed at the beginning and they just want their dreams to come true and having to realize like the reality of the world. Like, I really like the scene where the senior comes back and is their server, you know, like Mm. that, like small moments like that, that I, I loved kind of MVP Michael. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 
MVP fried clams. It's the fried Special. clams. Yeah. I mean, um, I think, yeah, I also do like, well, the school is very competitive and like Lisa is just like, I realized I said like she could kick out of the dance program. It's more like she's just cut. Like she just, they're just like, are yeah. like, you're not good enough. You're just not good enough to, to continue yeah. to do this. Um, I feel like Coco was the only one who was like, I'm going to be a star. I know. And, yeah, yeah. And that most of the other characters were more sort of in the, position of like the lane i i just love doing this and so like obviously i want it to be my profession because i want to i want to spend my time doing this thing but Mm -hmm. not like i i need to be like famous or what whatever which i know that's the title of the movie but like i liked because i think that's also more accurate to like what art school is like is like most people are there not because they like need to be yeah and they need to have made a specific impact on the world the way that coco talks about like Mm -hmm. I don't know, something about reincarnation and impacting the world and the cosmos or something. But like most people aren't motivated by that grandiose of a dream necessarily. It's just like Mm -hmm. a a love of the doing of the thing. And so I liked that that was, that was more the overall feeling of why the kids were there. Yeah. And I do feel like that when you get those other side characters, like the characters that don't, you don't follow their stories. Like it does feel like the other kids at the school are just like, I'm listen, I'm just trying to master the trombone. I'm going to yeah, yeah, right. like, I really just want to get in the New York symphony and yeah. call it a day. Yeah. yeah. Um, I liked this movie for the most part. Um, uh, I do think it's like a little long. Mm, totally. Um, mm-hmm. I definitely think it has weird pacing issues because it's so, and I think the pacing issues come from it being so loose formed yeah. that it kind of just like meanders at points. Yeah, You're not sure where it's going necessarily. Right. Yeah. There's not like a driving thing. Um, but that being said, like I, this is like a slice of life kind of film. This is like all, if you've never seen it, it's like all basically vignettes that happened over the four years of their high school. So I think that like idea is really cool. And it did, it does, this does not feel like my high school experience, but I think it does encapsulate kind of like, even if you don't go to a performing arts high school, just the kind of like the way it's just like every like high school is your life when you're in high school. Like it's mm-hmm. like, it is mm-hmm. your, it's basically your job. And so you're there all day. And so like, I think the movie does a really good job of making you, feel uh, like that is the entire the entire world even though we're in new york we are we are in the performing arts high school so i think that's really cool um and i like that it it's not a mean film it's Mm -hmm. not like like making fun of them for like thinking that they can yeah it's not it doesn't have like 2010s irony all over it where it's like (laughs) imagine being like someone who wanted to do theater or whatever so cringe to like theater yeah right it doesn't have that. Um, there is like some cynicism for sure. Yeah. Like, but I think like it does a good job of kind of balancing the like really dark. Like it is interesting that they keep, even though things keep happening in their lives, there is nobody really that decides that they don't want to do this anymore. Like they're like, this is too much. I can't do it. Even like, so apparently uh, Lisa, the one who gets kicked out of dance, mm-hmm. the initial script was going to have her jump in front of the train and commit suicide. Um, and MGM was like, I think that's, I think that's too dark. I think yeah. we need to rethink that. And yeah. I think it, it actually makes it better that she's yeah. just like, okay, I'm going to be a drama student. Yeah, instead, I like that like, a lot. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did. Were you worried she was going to push Coco? No. Oh, I was. <laughs> I was yeah, because they kept focusing because Coco was like dancing, right? Yeah, she was, the, like, I thought dancing. that maybe the misdirection was going to be that they would make you think she was going to jump herself, but she would actually push Coco because yeah. Coco was like, you know, having fun and dancing and singing and being yeah. kind of obnoxious while she was really upset. Not yeah. like Lisa and Coco are not like t- in. They're both at the stage. They're, they're not together. Right. It's not Coco's not like making fun of Lisa for getting caught. They're right, not right. aware of. No, that. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Coke, because Coco's rivalry is with Miss Miss Ballerina Girl. Uh, what is Hillary. her name? Hillary Van Hillary Van Dorn. Um, I think that there's. I mean, it's definitely weird. Watch. There's some stuff. I we already said, but there's some stuff in 2024 that's gonna make you be like, hey. uh, there's definitely some race stuff that I was like, hey, bye. yeah. <laughs> um, but. It's 1980 in New York, so it's not terribly yeah. surprising to be honest. Remember the scene where she's like, "Read Othello, he's black." I yes. think that was wild. So, what what great teaching to really connect <laughs> with students. Wild. 
<laughs> Wild. Also, also, he destroyed like destroy, the like, school literally. and then was allowed to continue being a student there. Like that's that was the craziest part. Is he like breaks the like the cabinet Glass doors cabinets, for the yeah. for the library? Yeah, I mean that be probably it would that would probably be true. I think he, um, yeah. he's, he's probably, probably suspended maybe for there. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. We try not to get kids out of school very much anymore, um, which I think is good. But I think what's wild is her um, figuring out he can't read and then choosing to like shame him about it in front of the whole class as like a teaching. Yeah, method. Oh, God. I cannot like I understand that times were different, but like you teach in a New York City public school, like the idea like you've never encountered this before. Like I don't understand. Right, right. I don't understand how someone can be a professional teacher and think that this was the way to approach this <laughs> student about this issue. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's um that's a cho- she made a choice for she sure. Choice. She and definitely she doubled down on that choice. And then the point of the movie is she's right. And look, I think it's good. <laughs> I think it's good to hold students to a high standard. And I have no issue with her if she were like, look, you're obviously not there and we're gonna have to do work to get you there. But like I need you to understand you that to you work. can't you have to work. You can't just like coast by on being a great dancer. Like we are gonna yeah. need to put time in to get you to the level you need to be academically. That yeah. I think is great. And the, the point of schools. But she just berates him and publicly <laughs> shames him, and then, um, and then at the end, he like yells at her about it, and she's like upset about something. Else. Do we ever find out what she's upset about? Her husband. Her husband. Oh, okay. I wasn't paying attention either because I also don't care about teachers. I guess. Um, I. You famously don't like education. I don't like it, you know. And like, like Leroy does have a bad attitude, right? But like, for yes, good okay. reason. He's a teenager. Hello. Yeah, it's understandable <laughs> yes. why he's why he's overwhelmed in these classes. And um, but but he does have he does have bad um, you know, emotional reading skills in seeing her on that bench and thinking like now's the time for me to approach her and like really to approach her and yell at her <laughs> yeah. really get into it about whether or not she's going to flunk me so yeah it was genuinely crazy though to watch this movie and he's like alvin ailey wants me and he didn't mean the company he meant the, the person guy. alvin yeah. ailey and i was like holy hell that's crazy that's, that's it girl that's like that's, that's it yeah. <laughs> well hold yeah. on if we're gonna talk about name drops in the movie i think we have to talk about the line that i texted you all when i was watching it <laughs> i play OJ in the first First, like five minutes of this film, yeah. we get an OJ Simpson reference. OJ Simpson reference. She is. I didn't know he was in Towering Inferno. I don't I've even know what Towering it. Inferno is. Look, it's a great scene because I'm sure that this happens if you run a, a public performing arts school that people who don't really know what it means to like give a monologue audition are just like replaying a movie scene the way you would as a child in your living room. Um, yes. But the crazy thing, the thing that they did not intend to be a standout part of the scene at the time that they wrote it is the part where she says, I'm OJ Simpson. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. I will say that whole audition sequence... It's fun because there's so many of them that are bad. Yeah. Right. Like, but like Doris still get and like in. Ralph. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's. Oh, you think Doris is bad? Wait, let's talk about this. No, well, not, necessarily, not bad, but like I, it's, it's that it's playing with that trope of like, I'm trying to get to you. It's not about like the audition that it's you're very seeing. a chorus line. Yeah. But yeah. It's like, what are you trying to get out of coming here? And I'm seeing, seeing through the audition, the person that would, you know, that's going to be here. I do I, think the audition sequence is more, less about them proving that they know whatever and more. Do they have the spark? Do they have the thing? Yeah. Like when she sings her song, which is funny because it's she's in a drama audition and her mom's like, yes. you have to sing. There is something about it that makes it compelling because she just makes it then like a she makes it a speech. She well, makes at first it, it yeah, yeah. At first, I thought it was play it was played comically because of her mom's reaction. Like she was crying as if she was yeah. like giving the performance of a lifetime, which. Yeah. I mean, I guess you want that kind of support, bro, but but my God, she was like mouthing the word. It was so funny. I mean, there is a yeah, lot of, well. there is a, there are a lot of jokes in this movie. Oh, like yeah. it's not, yeah. it's not a dour mm. two hours and 15 minutes. Like it is. They do laugh at their, at like the how stupid, yes. Yeah. How, how stupid this makes us feel and look like doing this, doing this like Russian scene outside in the snow, like with a pregnant when belly. When she ends like, that scene by being like, I have to remember this feeling for acting. Yes. Yeah. 
yeah, so, yeah. When they're like ma- like slowly eating, so they can yeah. Like, Absolutely, a lot, it's a lot of the acting stuff that's yeah. like the joke, which yeah. is. Yeah. I actually thought the music, the whole Bruno and the the head of the music department, like that kind of back and forth, it got a little it's it got a little tropey, right? Of the mm-hmm. like, this is the new age, man. Like this music's yeah. gonna go this way. But I liked their back and forth and their and their um one offs, like when Bruno was like, I don't need a full orchestra, I can just do this all alone in my basement. And um Mr. Shrofsky was like, That's not music, that's masturbation. <laughs> that's I was I chuckled. That was Chuckle. very smart. Yeah. 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 Which is surprising because you don't know what masturbation is because um Adam's the only person on this podcast. Adam's the only one that's porn. ever watched porn. Well, I don't think he does either. He just watched porn. Oh, I just watched watch it. it. Oh god. Yeah. I'm a cinephile, Molly. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's the love of the of the craft. The love of the craft. <laughs> sure. Oh, you don't yeah, listen yeah. to my porn gaze. Uh, uh, porn, porn gaze. <laughs> porn gaze. <laughs> porn gaze. <laughs> that's the, <laughs> that's the <laughs> that might be the hardest I've ever made my. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow um well, that does exist probably doesn't it anyway i would, say, I would yeah. say if molly your biggest complaint is like where's the resolution what am i supposed to take away yeah. i would say my biggest complaint is like there are too many characters we are trying to follow mm. if you are trying to make a cohesive narrative now yeah. i don't think i don't think they were cares about making so, a cohesive narrative yeah. so in that regard they did it well yeah but i think i just would moments, rather watch a movie that had a cohesive yeah narrative. i think there were moments that they were trying to like it did feel focused on doris and ralph but maybe because they just had like really compelling stories that made me like interested they it, it felt yeah. like she was like the internal discovery and ralph was like the pressures of real life like kind of caving in on him mm-hmm. so it was like interesting to watch that i wish if it was a cohesive story or co- cohesive coherent story that it would kind of just follow it would yeah. focus a little bit i feel like around midway they made like ralph and montgomery and doris kind of like that kind of like trio main. kind of the yeah. main and then coco was also like pretty fleshed out but kind of on her own mm-hmm. um because like hillary came in late lisa's yeah. story is like a little less complex bruno's story is less complex like uh yeah i guess leroy is also pretty much a main character but yeah also a little yeah. bit more um i think like like you know leroy's thing is all about great dancer not good at school whereas Mm -hmm. like doris like yeah you can sum it up as like she finds herself boring she's taking on other but i feel like we see more facets and more like ways she tries to explore that and that sort of thing as it goes along we see we see more change in growth in her too like leroy doesn't feel like a very fundamentally different person at the end of the movie as he was at the beginning right right. maybe carrying slightly fewer knives but otherwise pretty (laughs) much the same he has a lot of knives at the audition that um, audition was crazy. Leroy's he audition with, yeah. was crazy. And I feel like I'd be like, well, he's a great dancer. I mean, I don't know. What to- <laughs> You're saying you wouldn't flunk him? Yeah, he just he it's he's he is like a prodigy almost, right? I think like yeah. no other male dancer, at least from what we've seen, c- kind of compares to his talent. Yeah. yeah. Um so I, I did wish that like we got to see him enjoy the dancing a little bit more mm. like it was like this is why I'm here because he does discover it right when he auditions he he's not in it to actually audition he was like I don't know I kind of like this but blah, 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 I'm going to stick around to it that yeah. um, it just it just ended up being so focused on him being illiterate which is like what our third time having an illiterate character in Shogay's canon now Four? Wait, did Annie you say and Annie who else? I feel like there was another. I thought there was another one. Like one. Small... Oh, Lucas. Lucas. Lucas right tell in. us who. Re- remind Nick, us who was Nick, Can you timestamp where we talk Nick. about literacy? <laughs> yeah. Nick is still listening to the Annie episode, so I don't know if he thinks there are other episodes. Can you see like individual statistics of like people, individual <laughs> users that are watching the YouTube videos? Is that how that works? No. No, we, no, just, we just still tagging. We, we still tagging. <laughs> and then he go, and then they go back and delete the tags later <laughs> and it's what? always a funny part it's always it's a funny always part. funny so it's always nice for us to be like yeah slay <laughs> is nick a bot is nick a bot well if he is he's got a great sense of humor <laughs> <laughs> 
Is it all of the Annies or is it? Is it he goes back and forth the from, from the three Annies, I think. It's less the 2014. It's mostly the 1999 and the 1980, whatever. Interesting. Original. Well, I guess we hit somebody's special interest and you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, Apart from all that, though, I don't really have a lot to say about this movie. I'm going to be completely yeah. frank and honest. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I just think it was like surprising how it like abortion. Yeah. Suicidal exploitation. ideation. Exploitation. Um, alcoholism. Reference drug use. Definitely alcoholism. Um, reference to, like violence, like like uh, bad yeah, language, violence, bad language. <laughs> Um, being gay, just like a bunch of you know, really awful topics to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I do want to say just, it is 1980. There's how many mainstream movies had like a gay teenager who was like, yeah. sure he was sad about it, but it wasn't. But was like, saying like I'm gay and this and <laughs> right, and he wasn't like getting be, like beat up or anything. Yeah, to yeah. be fair yeah. to the whole plotline with Montgomery, like he still has friends and. <laughs> you know we're supposed to understand like he will have a a fine life like a fine, he, yes. it could be a more tragic character than it is it's just yeah. a scene where he's like sitting in the house with playing his acting friends but playing well the yeah. guitar scene also but like when he like is explaining to them about it and he's like sitting but like very far away from them in the house and it's very dramatic and everything and it's like just so rot and I just mm -hmm. I just I again have trouble believing that he's the one gay kid in the class so the only one <laughs> only one the real the real version of that would have been like and then like Ralph tries to like tr try him out too that's like did the you, real did you think well, maybe in that scene where he goes to Ralph's dressing room after he flops and then like Montgomery is kind of like putting his head on Ralph's uh Shoulder? Did you think that maybe that yes. was where they were going with it? Yeah. Well, I, I thought know, that's yeah. where they were going with Montgomery in general. I thought that he was like had like unrequited feelings for Ralph because I actually didn't know if they were going to do he had unrequited feelings for Doris. For Doris. That's what I thought at first. That I was like, oh, he's realizing now this would have been a gag if he was like bisexual. He invented bisexuality. Well, he invented bisexuality. Well, he invented bisexuality. Didn't. I thought that it did. was gonna be not so much that Montgomery liked Ralph, but that Ralph, like you said, like the trying on that Ralph would be at a at a vulnerable moment and then like curious about right. what mm -hmm. it would be like and then it was mm -hmm. going to make a move and then it would Well we were scared he comes in with the dress at that one point and he like flirts like yes, he flirts he's with like, yeah. so yeah. I was like oh I wonder if that's what Well we were scared that right. Ralph was going to like take his anger out on Montgomery. Yeah. That's what we were really afraid of. So I'm glad that it didn't go there. No, it just kind of peters out. I mean like Honestly, yeah, kind of a beautiful scene to be real. Yeah. I realized that they weren't going to do any like, and then something dark and scary happens. Like right. yeah. how often do we get to see two men just like comforting each other physically in a non sexual right. or romantic way? Like, I feel like that's something people talk about all the time. How like most men, the loneliness of men. Yeah. Because like mm -hmm. male friendships are like touch is not supposed to be part of the friendship. Mm -hmm. And so it mm -hmm. means that a lot of men are touch starved if they don't have a romantic partner. Cause it's like the only outlet that they have for it. So yeah. Really, Somebody. really nice. Just, just comfort yeah. in your buddy. Yeah, it was a nice scene. Um, even though he definitely called him the f word like ten minutes before, yeah, so that's, that's cool. True. But it was 1980. Who was? Who weren't they calling the f word? You know what I mean? It's fine. Um, is there anybody else? No, Coco. Co oh, Bruno. So Coco, Coco and Bruno. So the Coco of it all. Mm. <sighs> Is she he Francois Lafitte? Definitely a fake name. Yes. Yeah. Comes up to her at the diner and he's like, Aren't you in a chorus line? And she just goes, Mmm, mm. totally. She's not, right? No, I she's not. just going I also with got it. a little yeah, confused, just, but yeah, I don't think she was. She just went with it, but I think he also was like shrewd enough to be like, Oh, let me, you know, let me Pray her butter up. up. Yeah. yeah, butter up. Um, that's a very visceral scene. The scene where she is yeah. casting couched yeah. for an adult film. And it's just, it's that feeling of like, she knew that this wasn't right, but like immediately like being told like, what, don't act like this isn't like, you don't know how this works. Yeah. You know, and like just preying on the. That the is, naivete. that scene is like the opposite of the scene with Ralph and Montgomery, where it turns out like it ends really nicely. Yeah. 
this is like, I wanted it. I wanted the movie to be, have this guy have the moment of being like, all right, just go or whatever. And he yeah. doesn't like it's no. uh, they, I don't know what else happens after the, the scene ends, but it's not good. Yeah. yeah. So that was the one that I felt because she like inspires Bruno, right? Who's like this musical genius, but like only plays in his like synths, synths and everything. And you know, he has a very, very supportive dad that like <gasps> basically plays his music Don't spoil out. My MVP, world. RJ <laughs> plays this music out in the world because it's like you, this music is good. It, should, it deserves to be heard. Blah blah blah. And so like there is something really optimistic about her that she's like, no dreams can come true. Like for people like like if there's Ooh. talent, like it will happen. And you know, she sings. Uh, out here on my own which is like this beautiful song and like in the empty auditorium with just bruno and and i think we're supposed to understand that she's this one who's on the fame song yes. that he's playing he's that's he's, her voice they're basically working together like yeah. he's writing music for her to perform to and it's it's really good stuff like like genuinely like the music i mean it's the only music that we're hearing but they're all from him and her so mm-hmm. it, it's it's that like feeling of having that being taken away from you, but, but having the ending be so vague of like, you don't know, right? Like if she, does she give up, but she's still there. She's standing, she's singing the graduation yeah. song, you know? So like, you hope that like, this is something that maybe, maybe she does like get too proud, right. Of like, yeah, I deserve to be a star right now. Like it's like, like face of real, like touch of reality. That like I definitely feel like what we've learned of the character before the exploitation scene makes me think that she would not give up from yeah. that happening. I think she's gonna get yeah. savvier, but I don't yeah. think that this is gonna destroy her. I think she's gonna yeah. persevere. Yeah, I almost feel like the way she does her little solo in I Sing the Body Electric is like Triumphant. really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um and what? the last time we saw her was in a yeah. not powerful moment. So it's very yeah. cool. Um, let's talk about that graduation song. Will you want to listen to it? Yeah. was definitely written by people who were on drugs in the 70s. Yeah, what the hell are they singing about? <laughs> I what is the body you. electric, so diva? This, so none of the songs that are in the movie are in the musical. When we did this, our teacher added I Sing the Body Electric to the beginning of Act 2, which is a wild... It doesn't you know make what? any so sense. It makes more sense singing it at a graduation. Like, they're yeah. singing it with this, like, great sincerity as we go on we remember yeah, yeah. Very that. like it's like here we are it's the big graduation song you all know it, ladies and gentlemen but like what is this <laughs> i would be I so think- confused if i were like in the audience i would be like what is that is it is like their mascot something with electricity like what's, body elect- I, I, there's oh, something here we go about this or the performing arts body electrics <laughs> here they come <laughs> coming down on the field <laughs> So I Sing the Body Electric is a poem by Walt Whitman, written in 1855 from his collection Leaves of Grass. Did we have electric in 1855? The poem is divided into nine sections. (laughs) Did the word electric already exist? (laughs) (laughs) When did Um, Benjamin Franklin uh, fly that kite? When was that? (laughs) I wonder if I can find... That's so funny. Here's I mean, I'm joking, but like, me. what was their understanding of electricity in 1855? <laughs> actual genuine question. I mean, like, they, they, have, the they knew they knew that there was a, something. I know that, but like, they didn't have light bulbs. So, like, what did they think that? Did they know cells? Or do like, they have light bulbs? Okay, wait, maybe I'm sounding really dumb right now. Let me give me a second. When did, when did we invent light bulbs? Listen, we were not science majors. Okay, we do not have degrees. I didn't in science. do STEM. Okay, <laughs> we're not, no, we did STEAM. We did STEAM, honey. <laughs> 
Mass raised the light bulbs in 1880. Okay. Okay, so they kind of knew, but like, I I, do not know. Control stars. No. No, so the lyrics it's don't. Just the na- it's just the name of the. Okay. It's just the name of the poem. Is I sing the body electric. I sing the body. I'm just going to read the first stanza. Thank you. I sing the body electric. The army of those I love in girth me and I in girth. Oh, God. In girth. Oh, I feel they, that in girth. Oh. They will. RJ, have you been watching? Have you been listening to my other podcast? I've been listening to Porn Gaze. Yeah. <laughs> I love the engirthment episode of, of, of Porn Gaze. Stop it. <laughs> they will not let me let, they will not let me off oh. till I go with them respond to them and discorrupt them and charge them full with the charge of the soul I think this is about sex Adam <laughs> was it da- it was not a, oh well no Walt, Walt Whitman was the horny one famously do you know oh. this no he's the one who sent letters to his wife he right? sent letters to his wife being like I want it I can't wait. I can't. We can't even. We it's can't even so say it. vulgar. Okay, wait, what yeah, I would no, say. Like, me, yeah, I love what what stinky what your ass to, is. Like it's tell crazy. Me what to, tell me what to Google, and then we're just gonna we're just gonna play my reactions as I read it. Hold on. <laughs> Walt okay. Whitman horny horny letters. Yeah. That's probably good enough. <laughs> wait, this is gay love letters to the centuries. Was he gay? <laughs> No, wasn't it Walt? Maybe it wasn't maybe Walt. Was, maybe it wasn't Walt Whitman. Who's the gay? Po- who's the gay? Gay uh, horny- Oscar? No, 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 not gay. Sorry, horny poet. Horny poems to wife. Famous poet. Where does it say? No, type it. Type oh. it. Letter. Oh my god! Who was that? James Joyce, sorry, James Joyce. Oh, well, he's Irish, so. He's, and he's, James Joyce, I think, is not a poet. I think he was just a novelist. novelist. He wrote Ulysses. He wrote Ulysses. He called his. Oh, I saw a headline. Hold on. (laughs) Dirty Little Fuckbird, is that the one? I I thought that we weren't going to air that, Adam. Oh, sorry. I'll bleep. Bleep, bleep. Oh, my God. I just read one. Oh, wait, okay, letters below. Oh, my God. Yeah, look for December 8th, 1909. Okay, December 8th, 1909. Are you in the Paris Review? <gasps> oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> Twice? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, Okay. <laughs> Oh, backwards. wow. Backwards. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and hours. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, he's got away with words. <laughs> Shameless tongue. Wow. <laughs> See, Adam, it is about sex. I sing the body electric, explores the physical body in connection with the soul. Celebrating perfection of the male and female body and the importance the body ca- casts upon the soul and bodies connecting with one another. None of that is about sex, RJ. He had a very specific... Um, bodies connecting with one another? That's not sexual? Girl, this is the most evangelical nonsense I've ever heard in my life. The I'm soul. reading that one, not reading the AI overview. Oh, you got to read the AI overview. It's always right. <laughs> I sing the body. Molly, we've lost Molly to James Joyce, by the way. <laughs> Molly is enraptured. <laughs> well, I've never read anything like this since Out of Toulouse. Ever so. <laughs> yeah, before pornography was a like, James Joyce. We're like, you list these nuts. <laughs> Excuse me? Excuse me? What was it even supposed to be? What was that even? You, Ulysses, <laughs> you list these nuts. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the stupidest thing you've <laughs> I sing the body electric is a poem by Walt Whitman that celebrates the human body and its importance in connecting people. The poem's meaning includes body as a miracle. 
Uh, the speaker body describes the body as a, as a miracle that gives people their identity and connects them to others. Body is a source of joy. The speaker proclaims that having a body is part of a joyful, ordered, and beautiful universe. Body as a source of connection. The poem argues that the body is important for four Okay, but what does this have to do with graduation? <laughs> They're all connected. They're all going to be stars. Stars in the constellation. The constellations are a cluster of stars. The cosmos, the galaxy. This goes back to her speech about... Etc. Cetera, et cetera. The world. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I have some questions about this poem that I need to ask you off air, but um, I think, or not the poem, the letter. The letter. Um, <laughs> Do you need me to define some terms for you? No, I'm just, I'm curious about your, I think there's a, there's a ambiguous line that I'd like, <laughs> I'd like your interpretation. Oh, but- <laughs> you need your analysis on. <laughs> um, <laughs> great uh yeah i guess i can see that i mean i feel like you're a little bit doing like the thing of like being a like a sketchy a sketchy religious leader that's like and then this is like this and that's where we put it together with the meaning and they all connect yeah it's all intentional like that non-denominational yeah yeah. yeah, um (laughs) but i do think i could see that yeah she has that whole thing about like the cosmos and no, Gosh, I don't think I it actually has it. anything to okay. do with the rest of the film. I think it's mostly just like it sounds like it should. It sounds like a song that should be like, and we're celebrating. We did it. Yeah. But then when you like read the lyrics, you're like, but what? But what did you did? <laughs> because the lyrics are, I sing the body electric <laughs> lyrics. I sing the body electric. I celebrate the me yet to come. I toast to my own reunion. What does that mean? I so toast to my own reunion. When I, when I become, become one with the sun. I become what I become the version of myself that I have been working on yeah. this entire time. And I'll look back on Venus and I'll look back. I'm going to do this. As a, I'm going to do this as a yeah, do it as and a I'll Doris. <clears throat> and I'll look back on Venus and I'll look back on Mars and I'll burn with the fire of 10 million stars. And in time, and in time, we will all be stars. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, actually, I think star, I think that that is maybe the real connect. Just the word stars has like, you know, that double meaning. Now, let, not, now let me jump not. down to later lyrics. <laughs> they rhyme. Yeah. Guess we, what word they rhyme with stars? We Molly. are emperors now and we are czars. <laughs> and in time and in time, we will all be stars. Russian. <laughs> yeah no it makes no sense okay but but it's a movie that was made in 1980 it's not supposed to but hey finale number graduation i do love a performing arts graduation concept would be a big musical number that you perform for, <laughs> yeah. for your family. Oh my gosh. Graduations are so boring. Absolutely. Everybody should have to do this. Yes. It doesn't matter what your major was. Everybody has to be in a big musical number. <laughs> Everyone is involved in the, in the musical yeah. number. I mean, this is more fun than singing. This performance is more fun than when I was in choir for my senior year and we sang Go the Distance from Hercules. Oh, don't hate on Hercules. I, lo- good. I love Hercules, yeah. but... We weren't giving a, a full like modern dance scene I know, in the middle I of the know. song. We didn't have a gospel part either. Yeah. A shame. A shame that a shame. you in South Bend, Indiana didn't have a gospel section. It's yeah. It it was fun seeing the little snippets of school because yeah, there was a little part where they were like showing like a gospel class that I'm like, well, what are the like the electives? Like I want like uh, that's a good point. Maybe that's where Coco's getting yeah. her, you know training in the multiple departments is that she's just doing yeah. the electives. Yeah. Hmm. It's like free for everyone. Yeah. Would you, I don't want to, I don't know what your closer is, but would you want to go to this high school? What a great closer since I didn't write one as usual. Um, <laughs> well, I was going to ask what class we would teach if we were. Okay. Should we save it for the end? Yeah. Let's not think about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Syllabi. <clears throat> Is there anything else we need to talk about? I know RJ already sang out here on my own. Should we listen to the actual version sure, instead of RJ's rendition? You and any thoughts on hot lunch too? Mm, no. no, I have no, no thoughts, thoughts on, on hot Overwhelming. Lunch. I would be overwhelmed in that cafeteria. That's my thought. In Montgomery outside eating. Yeah. Red 
rising star to guide me far and shine me home out here on my own. When I'm down and feeling blue, I close my eyes so I can be with you. Oh, baby, be strong for me. Baby, be love to me. Help me through. Help me need you. Her voice, she was like 20. When they film this, wow, she, she was like fifty nine. She was born in fifty nine. Oh, was she? You just looked it up. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah, yeah. And her voice just sounds so mature, so like, yeah, deep. Mm-hmm. Not like deep low, but like just like it just sounds like resident. It's, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Impressive. Um. Yeah, I thought for a minute that she was going to break into all by myself because that that song, the lead up to the chorus, sounded like that song to me. <laughs> yes, mm. I love that seventies music is like, like for for pop at least, it's like disco and then um these yeah like these like ballads like mm-hmm. <laughs> and they would yeah. like chart. sparse ballads yeah. You do love that. I, I love that for you, <laughs> and I love that for you. <laughs> Great. Is that, are we, is that it? What else do you want to say about 70s music? Is there anything else we want to say about fame? RJ? Molly? I guess if you, if you want, if you're in the mood for a dramatic film, a film, Mm -hmm. and you like learning about how artists train, I I like that it's actually not about fame. I've said this before on the podcast that I don't like movies that are about like rise and fall of famous people because I don't have any interest in being famous. And so I don't care about the cautionary tales of it, but I don't think, like I said, I feel like most of their motivations aren't really fame necessarily. And Mm. so if you're just in the mood to like see some people go into art school and see some drama, go and watch it. But if you feel like a movie musical, don't watch this because it is not a movie musical. No. Yeah. yeah, I do like that they show that it's hard work because I think there's still a lot of like preconceived notions that like, oh, well, performing arts is like fun and then it's not mm-hmm. like serious. But like you watch this movie and like, oh, no, it's like you have to be good at these things in order to even like <laughs> have a shot. It's the time. Yeah, it does a great job of showing that um, faculty in the arts do not know boundaries in the way that they probably mm-hmm. should. Yeah. I think that's improving. I think that that <laughs> mm-hmm. while there while there are still going to be people who are like this is the way you do it, this is the classical approach. I bet that the school would be a little bit more flexible with some of the students uh in some of these circumstances nowadays, but yes, it can be it can be genuinely difficult when the topic of what you are teaching is so based in personal experience and emotion sometimes to set appropriate guidelines of how much to share and not share or Mm -hmm. to rather to ask students to share and not share in your class. Because I do think that like some mining of your emotional past is like necessary to act, Mm -hmm. but there should be limits to that and how it's expected to be shared. Yeah. But I also think there's a better understanding of like how to talk to people who are like, I don't think, I mean, listen, I was never a dancer, so Mm. maybe it's the exact same, but like I would, it's, it's a bummer that she keeps being like, Lisa, you're bad. You're not sweating hard enough. Well, and there's also like, I mean, we see Lisa from the beginning talking about diets and she's talking about sweating. I mean, it feels like there's a really coded, like you're too fat for dance that's happening with that. So Mm -hmm. that's also definitely an element of it. And I, and I can't comment on how the dance world may or may not have changed because none of us have been, we're not like in the, the the real dance world. Um, But again, I would hope it's better than it used to be, but I'm sure that that still exists. Yeah. I mean, dancers, you've got to have like the strongest will. Yeah. Cause they, (laughs) the mental, like, I'm sure it's so like mentally draining to, to be, to want to like be a professional dancer. Cause it's, it's like, you always have to strive for perfection and like to us, like watching something that may not be perfect to them is already so impressive, but like you have to strive for perfection in order to, you know, I think also like actors have a little bit of, um, 
justification of like, there's a lot of types that you could be looking for in a role. And you can always say like, yeah. well, I didn't get it because they're just looking for something different than what I right. am. But I think in dance, like there usually, there's usually not as much of a type involved in dance. And yeah. so it's kind yeah. of just like, who's the best is like, best? that's at least well, my impression. Like, yeah. yeah. And like, D- dance dance it, like especially like the classical forms of dance are so like there is the pro there is the, the perfect pro- way to do right this way to move, do it. yeah right whereas like acting is like at, at its very core it's bullshitting like it's yeah. like yeah. completely being just making up everything like you're living in a full imagination of there definitely every are, circumstance yeah i mean there definitely are still classic characters and some expectations that go with it but mm-hmm. it's and not like to the same degree yeah. that right. that dance has yeah right yeah that's why it's in- i mean like because music is similar whereas like instruments are there's like a, a specific technique the way you're supposed to play specific instruments right but then like vocal singing is like a little different because you can have depending on what you're like going for like different genres have different yeah i mean it's all it's all yeah it's so crazy to me every time i interact with a musician that is like you know really trained and how it's just like there just is a correct way to play music and that's so kind of wild to me as a person who came from a discipline where again there's like often not really a correct way of doing you you say the lines right or whatever but like there is not an idea of correctness in the way of music where it's like you're just playing it too fast like you just are there just is an objective right. s- speed at which this is supposed to be played and you can't it's, ba- like, it's rhythm based I feel yeah. like doing it a different way like sorry that's not what's written what's not written down so like that's not what right. you're doing yeah 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 but that's like comedy is and is a rhythm it's a rhythm and comedy it's a rhythm. Um, and then I guess the only thing I didn't say was that I, I, I was glad that the Martelli kind of like new world, old Old world world, thing was like just that. And it wasn't, I was worried that it was like every, everyone was going to have, everybody was going to have that with their professors Mm, or something like that. So it was going to be like the new kids versus the old farts. And it was like just his story. And they really didn't spend a lot of time on it. It was mostly for like laughs. No. Yeah. Because it's like, yes, he's right. That like you technically can do this all with a computer, but it's like, it's also so impressive to see like the full orchestra of these kids like playing. Yeah, these I mean, pieces. it's it's like, frustrating that again, like of course I'm going to be like, here's a better way for all these teachers to teach. But like, yeah. instead of saying you are an educator, Molly, you have you have you have the right to t- thank to say you, that. thank you for well. acknowledging me as an educator. I mean, yes. it's frustrating for him to not say, look. It's not that there's no merit in this music or anything interesting what you're doing, but you're here to learn what it's like to play with other people. Yeah. And that's a skill that it's valuable for you to have whatever your music career is after you leave yeah. school. You know, it's like so it doesn't funny need to be so like, that's the way you do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All this storyline reminded me of was like the, the current version would be like someone trying to just do AI. Like uh, just like uh, AI, what like you know what I mean? I was gonna be like that's different though, but uh, yeah, I guess let me not have a knee jerk reaction to it. <laughs> not in the way, not in the way, but like I, I would just was like it, these everything like keeps. There will always be we will always be innovating ways to like make things like more efficient, or create whatever. creation. The, but when it gets yes. to like the creation. This this is the electronic stuff that he does is a step away from the hand wrought nature of learning the physical skill of playing the instrument. Right, and you right, could say right. that AI, if one uses it and then to create something, a raw substance that then one edits and like adds their own perspective to, you could say is the mm-hmm. same thing. Yeah. Um, I think obviously if a kid just like put something into AI and then turn that as an assignment, like then you didn't there needs to be you need to have worked on it in some way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um but I think I think it remains valuable to learn some of those skills. I, I'm in the middle with that of like it's valuable to learn yeah. some of those skills, but also sometimes when we get to but this is the way we've always done it, it's creating unnecessary barriers to people. Like the metaphor that I I use is like I think it's good for kids to learn how to like write things by hand. I think it's valuable to be able to jot something down at any moment. And I also like at least for me and my brain learning things by handwriting notes is like very valuable for me. It really helps me solidify information. But Mm -hmm. like 
if that kid has a learning disability or a physical issue that means that writing things is hard, let them just use a keyboard. Like don't let the, yeah, yeah. don't let the skill of handwriting be the barrier to accessing information and actually yeah, learning yeah. things. So I think that that's a similar thing to me with music of like, I feel like there's value in like understanding the physical element of an instrument, but that's not mm-hmm. what music is ultimately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Wow. Wow. Well, that was a serious thing. So now it's not fun anymore. (laughs) Well, the movie was very serious. So, very serious, very dour. Um, okay, so the critics, 81%. Okay, nice. but here's what I'm going to say. This 81% is indicative of all reviews from all time. So in the Wikipedia mm. article, it was saying at the time that this movie came out, a lot of critics were like, this isn't very good from from some of the like problems that we had. And then as the movie has kind of solidified itself, it was actually just added to the national registry of like important films or whatever Mm. that library of Congress one last year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, as time has gone on and people have been like, Oh, this is an important work. There has been some softening of those harder takes that, that came out originally. So that's all I wanted to say, but, um, I've got a couple of reviews. So we've got Raji, we've got Roger Ebert. (laughs) from the Chicago Sun Times. The movie has the kind of sensitivity. He loved this movie, by the way. He gave it three and a half out of four stars. The movie has the kind of sensitivity to the real lives of real people that we don't get much in Hollywood productions anymore. Anyone who ever went to high school will will recognize some of Fame's characters. The quiet little girl who blossoms, the class genius who locks himself up in the basement with his electronic equipment, the kid who can't read but is a naturally gifted performer, the wise ass, the self-destructive type, the sex pot, the rich kid, and on and on. The cast has been recruited from New York's most talented young performers, some of them almost playing themselves. The teachers are familiar too, self-sacrificing, perfectionist, cranky, love-hate objects. If the character types seem familiar, the movie's way of telling their stories is not. This isn't a movie that locks its characters into a conventional plot. Instead, it fragments the experiences of four years into dozens of vignettes loosely organized into sections titled The Auditions, Freshman Year, and so on. We get to know the characters and their personalities gradually as we see them in various situations. The effect is a little like high school itself. You come in as a total stranger, and by the time you leave, the school has become your world. Um, however, Dave Kerr for and the, I got all contemporary reviews at the time this movie came out. So, okay. Dave Kerr from the Chicago Reader gives a blurb. It's just a quick one, but I thought it was very interesting. Another environmental study by Alan Parker, whose previous investigations including included a Turkish prison with Midnight Express and a miniature Chicago Bugsy Malone. This time, it's the New York High School of the Performing Arts, where half a dozen main characters struggle to overcome their one-note personal problems through a cathartic ap- application of capital A art. The film is cut at such a frenzied pitch that it's often possible to le- believe mistakenly that something significant is going on. <laughs> oh, <Jeez. I've- laughs> God. And then Richard, Richard Schickel from time says uh, take the matter of style basically the picture has a grimy documentary look to it but every once in a while what appears to be the entire student body pours out into the street to do song and dance numbers some of which are cheerful enough but all of which break faith with the film's realistic premise then there is the question of plot development to consider in fame nothing ordinary happens to people does the best comedian in the class get a job in a club before he graduates then you may sure be, then you may be sure he succumbs to dope does a young actor betray uncommon sensitivity then homosexuality is his inevitable lot the dancer with the greatest natural gift his poverty and illiteracy make him prone to self-destructive violence the film is full of attractive young performers and there is a low-keyed conflict between them and a faculty that is trying to discipline their exuberance without stifling their spirits if the film had concentrated on that instead of on hokey melodrama it might have been far more engaging and truer to life 
Okay, well, firstly, disagree that it would be more interesting if we had more of the conflict between the faculty and the students. And secondly, <laughs> hard disagree that um, a bunch of uh, performing arts kids all breaking into song together is unrealistic. I mean, the scale at which they that's do so, girl. it's over-coordinated. Mm -hmm. yes. But like, you think these kids would be singing every afternoon in the cafeteria? Girl, Come go on. to a Denny's after a show. Let me tell you. I go to Denny's after rehearsal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no way. I thought those were very interesting. I could have pulled better ones or kinder reviews, but mm. I thought it was interesting what what their problems with it were, totally. and then like how over time people have been like, actually, this movie's better than I thought. Yeah. Um. Okay. On Letterbox, this is three point four out of five stars. I've pulled some some incredible reviews from the 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 lay folk. Uh, Samuel gave it four stars and quoted the movie "Fuck You, Leroy." This was my audition. <laughs> shouting was crazy it goes on for so long it i understand so shouting long. initially but like calm down move it goes on. on for so long but i do i do like a i like it does two things right it sets up that it's like oh this is like a it's gonna be like a heart it's like they're gonna be saying fuck in this movie a ton like right. it's sure. not gonna be like a dainty june little picture yeah but also i like how she is so upset, but she's trying to play it off like she doesn't care. She never care wanted at all. to come, but she looks distraught. And it like she's sets up the stakes of like of everyone, wants, everyone wants to, to be, yeah. be yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Cameron Bertram gave it two and a half stars and says the movie feels like more like a season of a TV show edited down into a movie where they only kept the most melodramatic scenes, which I suppose is fitting for a drama school. <laughs> Matt Patches gave it two and a half stars as well, said it's not it's really not healthy to be around that many theater kids. <laughs> And finally, Jamie Lauren Keels gave it four and a half stars and said, this is what life will be like after quarantine. <laughs> Written in March. Martin in March of 2020. And honey, Jamie, I'm so sorry to tell you. I hate to break your spirit. This is not what life is like. No. After quarantine. In fact, it's worse. <laughs> so <laughs> that's all. Um, okay. MVP. Uh, Molly, go ahead. I'll let you go um, first. Well, part of me wants to give it to Anne Mira uh, just because crazy, crazy teacher and uh, she really commits to being just like completely unconnected with her students. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to give it to... Hold on, I have to check which, which actress it is. What's her name? Maureen Teffy. Who plays Doris uh, mm -hmm. for, as we said, making me think I was going to be annoyed by her and actually enjoying watching her character grow. I also didn't say this. This movie is one of the first pieces of mainstream anything that showed what a midnight screening of Rocky Horror was. Oh, yeah. So it opened a lot of people's eyes to what that experience was like oh, wow. and is a reason that it got, went to a mm. lot more places in the country. Gotcha. Cool. And it was only because he had been to. He had just recently gone to a screening, like the 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 director. Um, I already forgot his name. Alvin Alan Parker. Alan Parker, um, Sir Alan Parker. Um, he had gone to a screening. He was like, "Oh, this is crazy. This would be a great way to get Doris out of her shell." Mm -hmm. And the guy who was leading mm -hmm. the 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 movie that night, he's actually like the local guy from New York that always did the. He gave oh, me like this is yeah. local. He is gave me local energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> RJ. Um, I'm going to share it between Irene Cara, who plays Coco, mm -hmm. and um, oh my God, I hate I did this. I'm sorry, I have to count back. Bar Barry Miller, who played Ralph Garcia. Um, I think Irene Cara Coco is so grounded and yeah. like there is like a confidence about her. And even though what she goes through is really horrible and it was really hard for me to watch, mm -hmm. she just has, she was just like such a great character and like she performs her with so much like, yeah, like strength and confidence. And like, even though like, right, like she does the thing of like pretending that she lives in this nice place, there's never any like embarrassment about like what she's actually good at and what she's talented at. It's almost like she's making the point of like, you don't need to know about my real life because all you need to know is that I'm a good singer, good, good actor, good dancer. Um, which is interesting of how Barry Miller portrays Frank, uh, Frankie, Freddie Prince, Ralph Garcia, where he's so, 
it got so annoying because he was so good at like getting just really grating and getting at the people that he was trying to get to. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That I was like, Oh, like I, I hate this guy. And that's the point. He's so Mm -hmm. good at it. Um, but because he's so animated, like, and he, you can't really tell if he actually likes being there, but like, he knows when you find out that like, he likes making people laugh, especially because it means so it's so important to his family and like his sisters that like, he makes people laugh that I, I kind of like, I, I I appreciated the, his performance way more because it it made me like kind of see like oh there was more depth in in, in how he started in the movie yeah uh, that I really appreciated it's the thing of like you're in high school and there's someone who's like really irritating and then some at some point you learn their actual backstory and you're like right. oh they come from a really bad situation this is a, yeah. and they're only their kind of outlet is this is this yeah and yeah. that's why they are kind of the way they are and I thought. His performance is... I actually was going to pick him. His performance is really good in this movie. I would say it's probably my favorite of all the kids. um, Mm -hmm. Because it's just so... It's so... I know that fucking person so specifically that it's like... It like took me back. But I think too that he really handles those like really... And he gets like the heaviest emotional monologues to give in this film Mm -hmm. and they are done really well and they're very sad and when he like freaks out at the church is really crazy I don't what happened to his sister I had to kind of look it up because they do the whole scene in Spanish which is what I said West Side Story should have done um she was attacked by a junkie she walked out out the front door of the apartment building and then she just got attacked but yeah oh god um yeah, that scene is he's really good in that scene. He's really good in the explaining of like what happened to his other sister who's like in a home now and like I just I I think his performance is really good and sets up like how he ends up going. I mean like there's obviously the trope of like stand up comics are like <laughs> broken people. <Yeah. laughs> but like I yeah, he's he does a really good job at this role and it's kind of huge to be like basically you're playing a famous person that already killed themselves. Like he Yeah. It's kind of why he's the only one in the movie who has that kind of like heaviness on his shoulders specifically mm-hmm. because there's like a real world thing they're pulling from. So, um, so because you chose him, I'm going to choose the parents. I'm going to choose Eddie Barth who played it, Martelli's dad. And I'm going to choose, uh, what was her name? Tressa Hughes who played Mrs. Finsecker, um, Doris's mom. I just think like they were both so funny yeah, in their own specific ways. When she comes to the audition and she slowly keeps moving closer. I know. It's, I know. it's yeah. so funny. I know. Um, and then like the way Mr. Martelli is so game for his son and there's no way he understands any of like what it is, like what he does, how he does it or yeah. anything. But he like has the line where he's like, I spent $7,000 on all this equipment, which like in 19, 19- 1980 is yeah. basically like yeah. thirty five thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah, and like I play your tapes all the time, and I get twenty yes, percent more. Yeah. I get yeah, more they tips. take twenty percent. Yeah. I just I like I really like those characters. I think obviously like they're just pulling the like theater mom trope Wait, for I'm sorry for I'm sorry. mom. But this reminded me of something. I had a son's memory. Um, I. <laughs> was in a lift on the way home from the airport in San Diego. And this man was playing a Coldy Calais cover by a man that was not good at singing. And I was like, is this man playing his cover <gasps> of this Colby Calais song right now in this car? Oh my God. Did you tip him more? I didn't. It? I think I tipped him the same because I don't believe in giving people better or worse tips. And uh, I just didn't know what to do or what he thought <laughs> would happen if I was going to be like, That's wow, so is this you? Did You're so great. Like, <laughs> I like. Did you feel him looking at you from the rear view to be like, oh, do you think I just was like, what me? other explanation could there be for or it's like his his friend son? or yeah, his son a like a mixtape. What? It was just like a man with like a like like not even on pitch not just like not just like okay this person is like they've got some basics but they're not really stunning me like just like not even a little Mm, bit a person that should be thinking it was a sanjaya situation a sanjaya in a lift situation wow (laughs) that's crazy um i've had a lift driver listen to an audiobook but the audio was like 
com- like Siri reading it basically. Oh. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, this is gonna. Get- you know what? If you're a Lyft driver, how are you gonna get your reading list done? I respect it. I understand. Yeah, I thought you were gonna say it was like I- a crazy section of the book or something. Like it was. Like, really I couldn't political. understand what the book was. It was oh, a female okay. protagonist, but I was like, is this romance? But, it's like but auto, I can't tell. It's, 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 it's based. It's clearly it's like transcription like, reading. Well, it's so clearly like one of those like really cheap. You can like publish Amazon. on Amazon yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever, and then you just have your Siri just trans like read it out loud. Yeah. Too. Right. But it was like, no there's James no Joyce letter. No, it know? wasn't a James Joyce letter, unfortunately. <laughs> now, that would be a lift experience. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, yeah, I would definitely, I would definitely tip higher for a James Joyce letter <laughs> being read by Siri. Well, <laughs> so I would tip lower. <laughs> so you don't believe in. <laughs> and um, feel differently when you're making advances <laughs> on a single woman in a lab. <laughs> no advances being made, just listening to great works by famous <laughs> famous authors. Yeah. Um I like when people say that like they've been they get in a lift and they're like clearly gay, so then they change the like music to like Lady Gaga or something <laughs> like that. Yes, I do I do appreciate when I get like musically profiled like Pre- that, musically it's profiled. Like, oh, wow. Mm-hmm. What vibe do I give off? <laughs> I feel like a lot of the lifts or whatever when I get in them, they just like don't have anything on. So I'm like, yeah, or yeah. they're fully having conversations. Like I was on the phone. Yeah, one time in 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 Phoenix, it was like an older lady, um, and she was fully like I think having like an an a blind date on the phone because she was like, well, you know, I really don't have time to go on dates, blah 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 blah, because of my granddaughter and I take care of them a lot. But you know, if you're interested in like da 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 da, I was like, oh my She's god, <laughs> oh my god, when, that's a show or something. There's yeah. something there. Something. When I was in Orlando, or no, I'm sorry, Atlanta, and when I went alone last year. I had to take it was like the concert I was going to was like in Duluth, which is like a close suburb of. So I like flew into Atlanta and then drove Wait, out. It, there's a Duluth, Georgia. There's a Duluth, Georgia. Yes, there's a Duluth, Minnesota. This is confusing to me. Okay, of course. Um, so there, there's also multiple Springfields in the country. Did you know? Well, that? yes, but Springfield is a bit more of a generic sounding name than Duluth is, don't you think? <laughs> no, they're the same. So uh, both trips, like to the airport from the airport, I was in a car where the person was driving with like the heat on and it was like May and uh, they were like driving very quickly, which I'm nor I do not ever get like car sick. I'm not a car sick person. And I was yeah. like, I'm going to hurl because they were like kind of, you know, trying to get me there as quick as possible, which I do appreciate. But the car was like stifling hot. And oh, I was like, man. Oh my God. <laughs> and I was like, but I'm like too nervous. Like, can I roll? Can I roll the window down? Can yeah. I get fresh air? I, okay. Sorry. We, we can stop telling the stories in a second, but I was once in a lift. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> <laughs> and, this is the closer. Okay, yeah. this is the closer. And <laughs> <laughs> it connects, it connects. Bruno's dad is a cab driver or whatever. Yeah. Um, and this woman was telling me about how she like cured her brain tumor with CBD. Oh, and she was no. like, <laughs> oh, she was no. like, you know, I. I California? Had, this is wrote, California? No, Wisconsin. Colorado. 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 Oh, I was wow. visiting a, a friend's wedding in Colorado. Mm. Um, <sighs> it was Missy's wedding. Oh, yeah. oh, and nice. um, she was like, yeah, like I had this growth in my brain and the doctor told me to come back like six months later and I did all the CBD and then it like shrunk. And I was like, wow, well, why did they tell you to come back in six months? And she was like, yeah, I don't know. And I was like, I think maybe they did because it was like possible it was going to go away on its own. Like usually when doctors say like, well, let's check in on this in a few months time, it's because sometimes things just like resolve themselves. So it might have been... That was even, I was saying that internally. I wasn't going to make my Lyft driver upset. You, you but, were going to argue with your Lyft driver? But about- I was trying to like lead her down the path of like, you know, maybe, oh my God, wait, then this reminds me. <laughs> 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 but like, okay, this isn't a Lyft story, but back when I was on dating apps, there was this guy who had, who had something about how he like, he was like a chemist. He had like a science background and then he got like really into like alternative medicine. And so I sent him a message being like, oh, like what was that path? And then he like told me about how his mom got sick and stuff. And I was like, oh, well, I hope she's okay. Like, and he said something like, oh, are you into that? And I was like, no, I was more just curious. And then he unmatched me. (gasps) And I was like, okay, to be fair, like I am being a little bit of a looky-loo of being like, what's the deal with you that you think that like this happened? But like, I think what happened is that his mom was not okay. And then he was insulted that I... (laughs) Yeah. Yikes. Yikes. Oops. It's Oops. tough out there, it's, honey. Luckily, I don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> RJ, what's our closer? 
<laughs> yeah, if you were, uh, if you taught a class at PA, what, what would you think you would uh, be qualified to teach or would want to teach? Because well, they do. The only list- person who's actually qualified to teach is Molly. Right. Because <laughs> they do list off like all of the classes, like they in that like at the end of the audition segment. Remember that the teachers were or freshman year, beginning of the freshman year, all the teachers were like naming all of these like classes. Oh yeah, like. Hit, bit, Band or like there's yeah all all the individual profession or heads heads are like we're like saying the one classical dance b- ballet blah blah, blah. Yeah. the uh, one that stood oh, out yeah. to me the one that stood out to me you don't have to pick from that if you don't remember but the one that stood out to me was acting for dancers that I was like I think I would be that one that's like okay mm. <laughs> okay I know you're gonna go to this dance call right but you do have to read sides so let's get let's get the basics <laughs> let's. <laughs> What are you fighting for? You know yeah. what I mean? Michael yeah. Shortliff, let's just really, let's work just 101. 101. Yeah. And you don't have to be the best actress or no, actor you if you're acting for dance. You just need to get to the chorus. So that way, when they say, okay, now there's a big reveal that's happened and everyone in the townsfolk, the townsfolk have to react, you don't look stupid at the back. <laughs> you just need to be able to be like, oh, whoa. And really grounded in re- mm-hmm. real. In, in real. Grounded in real. In real. Grounded in real. Yeah. Molly, what would you teach? I mean, the thing that I'm, well, the thing I'm most qualified to teach is how to teach kids, but that's probably not offered at the school. Also, probably stage management, I feel like is not a topic. Um, no, so no, no. I'm going to go with probably a beginning acting class. That's probably where I'm going to be the most mm. useful. It's just like getting you, getting you started, getting you some basic toolbox stuff, getting your feet wet, you know? You wouldn't do like a literary focused class? Yeah, probably like a theater history class. I would also be pretty, yeah, pretty good at. I'd be yeah. hislet. I'd be a hislet, <laughs> hislet teacher. Adam, what about you? Um, I clowning. I teach. I teach French, oh, <laughs> which they did say was offered at the school. Okay, sure. So. Not clown work, not no, Lazzi. No. 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 Comedic. Comedic. Uh, Comedia dell'arte. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, pour moi. No more. Yeah, you teach French to to the dance students. Yeah, <laughs> you just have to teach people enough. Yeah, enough French to to actually have an accent Bonne in a play. Du. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, you could do dialects. I could do. Yeah. Pretty good. I could do dialects. <laughs> you know what this one is a drunk aunt. <laughs> this is great. My favorite time of day is night. My favorite time of day is night. <laughs> what was my question from earlier? Would we want to go to this school? Oh, yeah, go? quickly. Uh, no. no. This seems like my nightmare. There's way too much chaos. I will say, I do think actually starting a little bit younger than college is smart if you're really going to be a performer. If you really want to do it. I yeah. think there's some logic to going to a performing arts high school if you're really serious about making a career in one of these fields. But yeah. no, it seems uh, overwhelming. The lunch scene and just the whole... There's a lot. Everybody's everybody's got so many problems going on. I don't think I could handle it. Everyone has so many problems. <laughs> it's a real Degrassi. I will there. say it does feel like the music students are like, girl, we're, I'm just trying to learn. Yeah. The, the yes. other music students like, are not interested in any of this. Yeah. She like knocks on the door and the like the two, two students are having an argument in like Russian. And she's like, sorry, I'm looking for Martelli. And they're like, he's across. He's the across hall. the hall. Anyway, anyway, yeah. we're just trying to figure out this concerto that we're doing. Yeah. yeah. If anything, if I because I'm not like a musical instrument, that's always something that I always like am jealous of or like wish I was. And I feel like if I was, I would I feel like I would want to like fully dive in and probably go for for like the instrument that I would play. Well and what know. and are you gonna hold back? You're not gonna tell us what the instrument is? The piccolo? <laughs> I would be like him. I'd play Swanee River in my little harmonica. <laughs> I, do wish, I do wish I could play the piano because yeah, that's very versatile, very, very useful. Everyone wants it. Everyone wants it. And yes. uh, you don't have to carry an instrument around because if you get like a tuba, like you got to like carry your tuba everywhere. But don't be expecting right, to right. like be carting around your piano. So you get to just be like, yes, you can just have you one there to, for me, please. Yeah. You can, can you project imagine, gigs can you imagine, because oh, they don't have a piano. Yeah. Owning a tu- tuba in New York City. Oh my God. Where your, your house, your apartment is the size of a broom closet. I played clarinet in middle school and I felt like that was too much to ask me to haul around. I played violin yeah. in fourth grade and I was like, this is as big as me. Yeah. yeah. This violin is as big as me. Well, we did it. We sure did. 
we uh for the first time maybe ever are under the time of the movie though so good for us good for us good for us fame <laughs> i'm gonna live forever <laughs> i'm gonna learn how to fly high I'm in the coming, coming together. together. People will see me and cry. Same. I'm gonna make it to heaven. Light up the sky like a flame. Same. I'm gonna live forever. People remember my name. Remember, remember, remember. remember. And then in the musical, they go, Voy a vivir pa siempre. Voy a llegar. She's, she's Hispanic. In mm. Okay, bye. Thank you for listening to the best revival of a podcast, Showgaze. You can find us on social media. Adam is at Adam Noecker on Twitter. RJ is at RJ Food Rocks on Instagram. And Molly is at Molly Matiny on Instagram. This episode was edited and mixed by Adam Noecker. This has been an Ampliverse production. You can find our show page and more information at theampliverse.com. If you'd like to send us your own takes on the movie we just watched, reach out to us via email and we might read it aloud on the show. Our email is showgazemoviemusical at gmail.com. Don't forget to follow us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your podcasts. And as always, rate, review, and subscribe to help others find the show. And now, as always, the show must go on. So stick around to hear what we're going to be watching next episode. I've spent the past seven years traveling the world perfecting my craft. You see, I'm something of a magician, inventor, and chocolate maker. So quiet up and listen down. Nope, scratch that. Reverse it. Mr. Wonka, I can say you're a man of great ingenuity. What are you doing? I'm making chocolate, of course. How do you like it? Dark, white, nutty, absolutely insane. Many people have come here to sell chocolate. They've all been crushed by the chocolate cartel. You can't get a shop without selling chocolate. And you can't sell chocolate without a shop. No daydreaming. What are we going to do, Willie? Huh. Huh? Huh. A double hum. Do you have a pencil and paper? Uh-huh. I got an idea. I know things haven't been easy for you. They're gonna get better. You promise? I pinky promise. That's the most solemn vow there is. Where do we start? A good chocolate chip is simple. Where is this? It's just weird. What's happening? Who wants a chocolate that makes you fly? Well, let's find out, shall we? Who's for a hover job? <laughs> Nothing to see here. Just a small group of people defying the laws of gravity. Ladies and gentlemen of the Gallery Gourmet, my name is Willy Wonka. He's good. Too good. Yeah, pretty sure I've gained about 150 pounds in the last two weeks. You could change her life, Mr. Wonka. Change all their lives. Run away! Every good thing in this world started with a dream. So you hold on to yours. Go, Mama. Mark my words. This is going to be the greatest chocolate shop the world has ever seen. So you're the funny little man who's been following me. I will have you know that I am a perfectly respectable size for an Oompa Loompa. An Oompa what now? Allow me to refresh your memory. Oh, I don't think I want to hear that. Too late. I've started dancing now. Once we've started, we can't stop. Discovering Voices, Building Worlds, The Ampliverse.